Well, good afternoon, everyone. Cynthia Tamain here with Interactive Brokers, and thank you for joining today's webinar uh, with Tim Moores of Market Geometry. We're going to be covering gold and grains, hunting those large swing trades in trending markets. But before we actually do start, um, CME Group has actually is sponsoring today's webinar. So what we're going to be doing, um, I'm going to pass the ball over to uh, Barbara Schmidt Bailey with the CME Group to give us a brief overview of those products that we're going to be uh, discussing in today's webinar. So, Barbara, you've got the ball. Go right ahead. Thank you for joining us. Well, and thank you, Cynthia. It's great to be here and uh, with everyone who's joining us um, from around the globe today. As always, CME Group is pleased to be co-sponsoring this event with Interactive Brokers, and we extend a welcome to you for today's uh, presentation, Golden Grains, Hunting Large Swing Trades in Trending Markets with Tim Morge. CME Group and Interactive Brokers have been working together to bring you professional education or webinars on futures and futures options for many years. And as Cynthia mentioned previously, we encourage you to look in IB's webinar archives under the industry-sponsored events for past events that we did in 2012 and 2013 including in-depth overviews of uh, CME Group markets, such as metals and grains, as well as to register to attend further monthly events. CME Group's agriculture markets offer risk management and trading opportunities and global benchmark products for grains and oilseeds, livestock, and dairy. Product offerings include standard and mini size futures contracts, quarter, cereal, and weekly options. You can go to cmegroup.com slash agriculture for additional product information such as contract specifications and fact cards as well as market commentary. Taking a look at our grains and oil seeds since um, I believe it's soybeans that uh, um, Tim is going to be focusing on today. Our average daily volume in May of 2013 for our grain and oil seed futures was uh, just over 627,000 contracts a day. Options were over 167,000 options a day, uh, contracts a day. Uh, very liquid, um, globally traded markets. Uh, taking a look at soybeans, um, we had an ADV in May of 160,000 futures contracts a day. The options market also very liquid with 62,000 uh, options contract traded uh, on a daily basis. The one thing I wanted to specifically highlight here is um, the increasing move we're seeing to uh, the electronic trading of options, and in this case of ag options. You know, CME Group futures are all close to 100% electronically traded, but it's really the options market, the futures options markets, that uh, still trade very actively uh, in our pits. However, our trading pits in Chicago and New York, depending on the product. That said, we are starting to see a trend to seeing more electronic options trading on the screen. Uh, so, for instance, our corn and soybean options are now traded 50% uh, electronically, uh, which is a, a trend that has uh, steadily increased over the past years, a couple of years, which means that your, your IB Trader workstation is really all you need to execute grains and oil seeds, futures, and options. On the metal side, because metals markets are highly responsive to overarching global economic and geopolitical influences, they present a unique risk management tool for commercial and institutional firms, as well as a unique, exciting, and potentially rewarding opportunity for active individual traders who seek to profit by correctly anticipating price changes. CME Group's COMEX metals markets over the flexibility, offer the flexibility of various contract size, sizes, which in turn means you can access markets best suited to your desired level of exposure. Um, these metal markets provide unique trading and hedging opportunities, and with an average daily volume of over 400,000 futures and options contracts traded, these metals markets are the most liquid in the world. Sort of an interesting anniversary today. We have uh, today, June 13, 1963, we uh, mark 50 years of continuous silver trading. Um, I'm sure Tim can, can fill you in as the history buff that he is. So we launched uh, gold and silver futures in 1933 
30 years uh, before our 50-year anniversary, but then in 1934, gold and silver were nationalized, which um, put a dent in uh, the futures trading. Thus, we say today is the 50-year anniversary of continuous silver trading. Um, and you can see here from the, uh, the uh, year-to-date growth percents that, you know, we are on target and on pace for yearly volume records in, in many of these products, whether it's gold, gold options, gold futures, gold options, copper, copper options, platinum, palladium. There's uh, just a, a lot going on, uh, you know, in the metals world, and you can, you can find more information about those products and, and market commentaries at cmegroup.com slash metals. One thing I did want to mention, just in time for uh, the 50-year anniversary, we are launching an additional silver product. It's a 1,000-ounce silver futures contract, which will launch um, trading day Monday, uh, which would start then on the Sunday night um, before, so this Sunday night on Father's Day. It's a 1,000-ounce silver future, which is uh, fungible with our 5,000-ounce um, um, COMEX benchmark and uh, is also uh, deliverable via the accumulation of five ACE um, certificates into one COMEX silver warrant, uh, which is uh, also a pretty unique uh, way of building a position with the smaller contracts, uh, which you can, can then deliver into a, um, a full COMEX silver warrant. We do a similar thing on the gold side with our micro gold and our 100-ounce uh, uh, gold uh, contract. Um, just one last thing I'd like to mention before um, introducing Tim is that uh, CME Group and Interactive Brokers have built a resource center at interactivebrokers.com slash CME, which is a great starting place for your, your day of futures trading. We populate it with news, quotes, charts, uh, other market updates. Uh, built specifically with the active trader in mind, so we hope that you will take a look there uh, and, and consider that a great starting point uh, for your trading day. Tim Morge has been a professional trader, author, educator, and mentor for more than 35 years. Besides trading his own capital, Tim is president of Blackthorn Capital, a private money management firm that works with several of the largest non-U.S. institutional portfolios, and he remains one of the world's largest currency traders. Tim has taught hundreds of professional floor traders at the CBOT and CME to become successful off-floor electronic traders. He is a regular lecturer at some of the most prestigious, prestigious, I can't even say that word anymore, prestigious, forget it, graduate schools of business and finance in the U.S., including MIT, Stanford, and the University of Chicago. He currently donates his time teaching basic technical analysis to fourth and fifth graders, accelerated students at 59 elementary schools around the U.S. via a program called Crayon Drawing. Tim's websites, medianline.com and marketgeometry.com, feature a great deal of free information regarding his trading methodology and uh, uh, trading uh, style, and are visited by thousands of traders around the world on a regular basis. Tim typed in the chat panel just right before we started that he's already been up today trading and lecturing for seven hours today, uh, which in my book means it's almost nap time, but uh, we, as always, are very grateful to Tim to making space for us in his schedule. And just for the record, Tim, I agree with your wife, say no to the reality TV show. So with that, enjoy the show. Hey, Barbara. For those of you that don't get the inside joke, um, I was contacted this morning by one of the major networks. They want to do a reality TV show. Um, in 1982, a good friend of mine, Richard Dennis at the CME, did something called the Turtle Program, and he put out uh, put out a go back and do what Richard Dennis did in 1982, which is interview thousands of people on a live reality TV show, and then pick out whatever 10 or 20, and then it'll be the they'll They'll film teaching them how to trade. That would be awesome. I don't think so. I, I think that would be. <laughs> I don't know, Barbara. What do you think? Jump in here. I think. Uh, no. I, I think. I think I do very good here at at uh, the CME Group and at IB, and this is lots of fun. And uh, I passed up being a chair at MIT and Stanford. Um, I, I think. I think it's it's a sign of they have nothing better to do. That's just my opinion. Anyway. <laughs> Don't you think? 
I hear you guys chuckling back there. I'll have I, to get I think hair. it would take over your life. That's what I think. I think <laughs> you like your life the way it is. <laughs> my wife said, you know, you'll be enjoy the divorce. <laughs> so anyway, they did that in the UK already and it failed. Yeah. Okay. So you know what? I'm out of there. Anyway, the funny thing is, I know the producer. I know him. He's a nice guy, and uh, I know he'll do a fine job, and hopefully he'll find somebody else, not me. But anyway, I'd rather, I'd rather, I'd much rather do this. I this is a venue that works well for me. Um, Barbara, is it possible for you to pop back to the CME slash IB front page? Just real quick. Or is it? Tim, that's something that I can do. I'm going to have to grab the ball back from you Please for just a moment. Great. Okay. Here we are. There you go. If you want it, listen. No, nope, you can put it right back where it was so I can see Dan. Oh. This, and, and, and I want the quotes as well. A little bit of Dan. A little bit Dan. A little bit of quotes. So down a little bit. I can do that again. Yeah, right there. Stop. Perfect. Great. All right. So if you're looking for a morning thing, what am I going to do this morning? What's going on in the markets? I, you know, I, I don't say this pejoratively or in a, in a mean way. Um, you're looking for you know, a weather forecaster or, a, hey, what's going on kind of thing. This page is perfect. It tells you, it gives you a broad view of everything there is, anything you might want to trade. And Dan also does a great job of, hey, I got, look, this is what's going on in this market. This is what's going on in this market. This is what's going on in this market, okay? That isn't what I do, okay? Dan is a great friend of mine. This, this, I call him a teddy bear. When I see him at events, you know, and by the way, he sends, if I, he knows I'm sick, he sends me cards. You know, we're great friends. It's not what I do. It's not what I do here. What I try and do here is something different. I try and show you exactly what I trade, exactly what I do. But if you want to know in the morning what's going on, what you might want to pay attention to, Dan does a great job. Go ahead and watch it. I think it's, I think it's a, a great presentation. It's not something I teach in the morning, breakfast with the masters, but it's not, hey, let's do this, let's do that. Instead, we look at Markets Live and take them apart. It's a whole different thing. So if you're looking for what's going on in the markets, what should I be looking for, I really recommend this page. It's a great page. It's also got news on the left-hand side. And if you want to see, a, you know, a brief what's going on in the world, Dan's great. And, you know, and I endorse Dan. Dan and I are good friends. So anyway, that was it, Cynthia. I just thought I'd give you a plug. That's my opinion. And welcome to it. So anyway, um, let me let me let me get my since you did her. There you go. There it is, right there. Copy that. Put it on your front page. If you got Firefox or something like that, pin it to the front. And uh, you know you got something. You you get up in the morning. You don't know what to do. Go ahead and pull it up and just run through all the different markets and say what's moving, what's interesting. I like it. It's a nice one-stop kind of information area. So. Um, let me do my, I have to do my thing, market geometry, that's one of my companies. Um, this, it's the educational arm. It's the one that does fifth grader trading. And by the way, this fall, Barbara, I know you asked if, if you could take it and your children could take it. I'm, we're going to offer fifth grader trading because, uh, you know, a good friend of mine, Chairman Steve, jo Steve Jobs, Chairman of Apple, passed away, and his charity foundation was funding that group, um, his significant other decided to pull the plug on funding of all charitable events. So we do not have their funding. It might come back. I don't think so, but it might. So instead, Market Geometry is just going to run it live and, and give it to the schools um, in virtual. Uh, they can run it virtual or they can get their playback. And uh, everybody, I know Barbara's going to sign up with her son, and we have lots of people that have asked. You can just sign up at the Market Geometry page. So we'll be working on that this fall. Shane and I are already working on it. And we're just going to do it from our own page. And uh, I've already talked to the 39 states that are involved. And they're, it's, one, in, in Illinois, it's called the Bright Star Foundation. But, but every, every state has their own deal. And Arizona's already signed up here. So uh, we're going to do that here. Um, so that's what Market Geometry does, as well as some adult education not trying to sell anything. There's so much free stuff. You could study the stuff at marketgeometry.com and medianline.com for two years and not run out of material. And we have lots of people, that's all they ever did, and they've turned into consistently profitable traders. All that we are, all we're trying to do here, all Barbara's trying to do, all Cynthia's trying to do is give, put out quality education. That's all. Um, disclaimer, 
the biggest one here is there's there is no holy grail. I don't have the holy grail. It doesn't exist as far as I'm concerned. If that's what you're here for, I'm I'm going to disappoint you because I'm going to tell you right up front I don't have it. I'm going to show you. Look, this is one person's experience. Your experience may differ. In fact, your experience will differ because I'm trading. I can't tell you how much money, but I trade for the four largest sovereign wealth funds in the world. So it's a huge amount of money, and you're not going to be trading that size of money. There are things that I do and time horizons that I have that you won't have. But that doesn't mean there aren't things in here, especially today. I'm going to show you something that until today I was unable, unable to show publicly because I have non-disclosure statements and codicils and all kinds of things that go back to the Commodities Corporation years and J. Private, when J.P. Morgan was a private bank of J.P. Morgan private banking, as well as some customers that said, no, I don't want this shown or this shown. Some things rolled off, and I'm finally able to give you a look inside how Amos Hostetter would trade, did trade, and taught me how to campaign and trade if you're looking for very large moves. And so we're going to sandwich two large moves in between how I regularly trade. And when I when I talk about campaign trades, I'm talking about doing with and a gagging amount of money. That's all I'm going to say. I have to do it. When I trade gold, I can do my own personal account in the CME account. I can do some of the trading in the CME account, but a lot of it I actually do have to do in the cash bullion market with central banks. So this is for trend trading today, and this is something I have been unable to show in the past, but now finally some nondisclosures and codicils have rolled off. And they roll off in time for me to go ahead and do this. And then at the end, for grains, because everybody's doing grains this – Barb and I talked about it. Everybody's doing grains this month. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to give you a tip on how I look for trends. I'm going to put you all in a position, and I'm going to give you homework. And then you guys are going to have to go away and manage the position. Okay, I'll put you in. I'll show you how to get in. And then you'll have to go and figure out – what do I want to do with this trend? Because this is how Amos taught young traders how to trade. Okay, you're in. Now manage it. Okay, so we'll, that's what we'll do at the end. It's a lot. This is a lot to swallow today. So I'm actually not going to read the chat panel at all. Please do me a favor. Let's go to the next page. This seminar, okay, this seminar is dedicated to Amos Hostetter, one of my first mentors. I was lucky I got to spend four years with him, which is all the, all, the entire time he was at Commodities Corporation. And Amos, there's only me to give things back. Everybody else is dead. I hate to say it. Or there's one other person, Helmut Weimer. He's retired and, and just enjoying his life, and God bless him. This is a presentation in the style I use when lecturing at MIT and Stanford. Okay, So when I, at, at, when I teach at a, those universities, and those are pretty good universities, this is how I teach. So please be patient while the material unfolds. At the university, this might be a three- or a four-hour lecture. Please keep your comments related to this material and my methodology. You know, if you if you got some other person that you follow, that's fine. Email Cynthia and let them do their own thing. Instead, just relax. Let this flow through. Don't get distracted by putting out comments. Just let, this is a lot of material here today. Let's just let it flow, okay? Most of you are here to view this seminar. Let's try and keep on track. Please. Hold your questions until the presentation is over because I'm not going to be able to read them. If I take time to read them at all, if I get distracted, there are so many slides today, we will never get this done. And if I cut this into two seminars, it would dilute it. So let's try and get this all done. That being said, let's rock. And, oh, one last thing. Cynthia, Barbara, one more time. Barbara, this is our 10th year together, if you can believe that. I don't want to rat you out. Ten years together with Barbara Schmidt Bailey and eight years with Cynthia. So these are my two favorite ladies in the market, especially when it comes to education. So let's go see what we can do. And, and uh, you know, in a lot of ways, this is, to you, you know, this is dedicated to both of you as well. So thank you both. All right, so we're going to campaign trade Comex Gold Futures, Amos style. And as I said, until today, literally until this week, I knew it was coming up. I was unable to show this. I wasn't even able to, even to talk about it. There were a couple times in the midday sessions at Market Geometry where we showed some charts that you're going to see today. We showed them live, but I really couldn't talk about the campaign. Let's look at a chart. 
This is Comex Gold going back to 1976. Most of you probably do not know this. Does anybody remember the Hunt Brother run-up? I'll look at one question. Gold and silver? Well, I'm going to – it's not just silver, okay? The things that you know about the Hunt Brother run-up, you don't know anything, okay? Because everybody that was involved – I know some people were in kindergarten, some people weren't even born. Everybody that was involved, basically, let me just explain this to you. They're not talking. Because if you didn't end up in jail, you're lucky, or at least sanctioned. Um, there were a ton of people there. I was in the syndicate that ran this thing up. But we, it didn't start in 1979. It started in 1972. We started buying in 1972. In 1976, we started buying gold as well as silver. Now, I was introduced to the syndicate by Amos in 1976. So I'd been with Amos for two years. I started buying gold. I had my choice to buying gold or silver. I started buying gold. Silver would have been a better return, by the way. But I just felt more comfortable with gold. Uh, when Amos passed away, he still had the position on. I actually managed his position for him as a thank you from his family. I was I was honored that they would ask. Now, we made this run up. Now, I'm done with questions now, okay, because I, 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 I just won't get this done. We made a huge run up. Let's take a look at this. And those of you that have been in here before or read my articles know that we look at swing highs and swing lows. If you look at this run up, here's our high. In order to make a swing low and a new swing high, we've got to take out a swing low. Well, where's our swing low? It's all the way down here. So let's take a look at the swing highs. We leave a slower, lower swing high, but do we have a swing low? We leave a low, but it's not a new low. Do we take out a high? No, we do not. We leave a low. Do we take out the high? No, we do not. And now we consolidate and do nothing. I have to ask you, Cynthia, is everything okay? Because I'm, I'm getting kind of a fuzzy sound and a beep. Is there, do I sound okay? Tim, that could be your headset. Uh, as long possibly. as I sound okay, I don't care. You sound fine, but I'll let you know um, if we do lose audio. Okay. So keep okay. going. All right. So we're consolidating now, and we're not making highs or lows. We come down and we make another new low and leave another lower high. So all the way to here, this is the swing high, this is the swing low, and none of these are anything. We don't have a swing high or a swing low. Take a look. From 1979-1980 all the way through 2002. No pointer? You don't have a little ball here? Cynthia, I'll do it again. Everyone should be seeing, instead of a pointer, a, uh, a bouncing red ball or that laser, around? that laser red ball. I'm able to see it. Okay. So here we are. We're not making any swing highs or swing lows. Okay, we've got lower lows, lower highs. None of them confirm. The only swing high is right here. The only swing low is right here. So we go from 1980 all the way to 2002. We don't have any swing highs and any swing lows. That is amazing. 20 years. No swing highs, no swing lows. That's an amazing amount of consolidation. That's caused by the relationship of price and time. If price goes vertical without using any time, time has to catch up. Okay? It's really physics. One cannot be disconnected from the other forever. So eventually, price and time will catch up. The sad part is, unfortunately, we don't have an equation that tells us how this catches up to this. There's lots of ways to try and measure it. None of them ever work much more than noise, much more than about 50%. So <clears throat> the best way to measure it is to wait for a change in behavior. We want to see 
one of two things, either a higher low and or a swing high. These are all lower. Look at them. Finally get taken out. That will be a major change in behavior. It hasn't happened for 20 years. If that happens, we might have something going. I hope you all follow me. Now let's move in. Given the extremely long consolidation of price after the high reach during the Hunt Brothers rally, this is 2002 I'm talking about, I expect price will likely double the at extreme price after finding balance. So in essence, I expect gold is going to reach $1,700 or higher, but not until it turns higher and breaks out of the consolidation. So my minimum target for this campaign is at $1,700, even though gold is at about 230 that's a long ways away. And we've got to break out of no, no higher highs and no higher lows first. We need a change in behavior. So take a look. Again, lower highs, lower lows. And you can see we call this a press. You can see this sell off here, and it's very organized. All of a sudden, we leave a low. We come up, it's not a higher low, or another, excuse me, not a higher high. But we did bust some of these presses. But look at the low, it's a higher low. And now let's move in and take a look at this area because something interesting might be happening. And we're right back at one of the major swings right before this thing took off. So price comes down. Leaves lows. You can see the nice little cluster. We've even got a little gap action right here. Where the chart's kind of ripped apart, and so this part no longer belongs to this part. And then it goes vertical. And we take out one swing high, two swing highs. And that's always my gold standard. If we can take out two swing highs, we're golden. We had lower, lower high, lower high, lower low, lower low. Lower low. We took out two swing highs. Finally, it's the first time we took one out in 20 years, but we took out two. Now, when we pull back, we don't make swing lows. We don't even make it. We miss it by seven, eight bucks, and then we turn again, and we start to take out internal highs. See it right here. So. Things are looking different. It isn't this lethargic sell-off with no swing highs and swing lows. All of a sudden, we're starting to make crisp swing highs, swing lows, starting to take out internal swing highs. We left a higher low for the first time in 20 years. Big change. Now, here's the jump. This is the Amos in me, so to speak. If it took not that long, 20 years, to take the move from 1976 to 1980, all the way up to $800 in gold, $850 in gold. It took 20 years of time catching up the price. That's a ton of energy when this thing finally turns back around. There's enough energy to it. We call it going red to red. In other words, it's going to double the range. We should go from this area and then twice the high that we made in the Hunt Brothers rally. That seems like a big jump in logic, but we do see this. It is measurable. But the hard part, is finding this change in behavior. So when this is over or when you watch it again, go back and take a look at the higher low, the break above the swing highs, then the internal break above this swing high. And you can see my downsloping median line. It's not holding either. Suddenly the behavior has changed. Again, I'm not going to answer questions now, later. Otherwise, I'll never get there. Just relax and enjoy the presentation for now. When we poke above the red upper parallel and take out this 
intermediate swing high, this inside swing high. I draw an upsloping median line. Low, high, low. It has a mathematical probability built in. I want to know now, what does it mean? What do I believe in? And where do I really think it's going? Am I willing to put my money on the table? Okay? And I'm, ta I'm not talking about 10 contracts. I'm talking about, you know, the money from the four largest sovereign wealth funds in the world. I'm going to put lots of money on this eventually, if I'm right. Now, let me show you, and then I'll explain how Amos is, would trade this. Do you believe in your work, and when do you trust your lines? Well, here's what I think. This has now gone parabolic. Price went from being horizontal to going vertical. This is parabolic. We made a lower high. Excuse me. One more time. We made a lower I'll say it again. We made a higher low for the first time in 20 years. We took out swing highs. We made a higher low. We took out this internal high. I believe in my lines. The stop is not particularly large. I'm going to buy just above this horizontal line where price went. It's right where price went parabolic, if you want to see it. You can see the small bars, and suddenly price goes parabolic. I'm going to draw a horizontal line across. This is a multi-pivot line. I want to get long just in front of it, and I'm going to buy about half my position. And it's got a nice little stop on it. I believe in my lines. I believe in this idea. It took 20 years for this action to happen, for this change in behavior. If I'm right, the payoff is going to be magnificent. Now, here's, here's the Amos logic. Buy part of a position. Get into the market. Make the market show you that it's right. When you get about halfway to where you think it's going, the market needs to perform. If the market performs there, then pull your full boat. Put your entire amount of chips that you're willing to risk on the table if you've got a correct stop. And that's a campaign trade. Now, I typically don't trade this way. Two, three times a year at the most. The, the opportunities are just not there. It's for very large positions, but it's also for a long period of time. So there are times when I do it, and I learned it from Amos. But for those people that have put out, there's very little bits of Amos out there. The people that have put this stuff out have no idea what Amos did. I'm going to show you some of the techniques that he used and taught me and how he would trade this. And this is exactly how I traded it. If Amos was trading this market on this move, this is exactly how he traded. I'm going to get long again right where price went parabolic. If it takes out these two prior lows, I'm gone. Let's see what happens we get. Price does come down. I get long at 264.5 right where price went parabolic. I check to make sure my stops are in, and they're below two swing lows, should be buyers down here. This is the lowest low since the Hunt Brothers rally. Let's take a look at what I'm risking. When you evaluate a trade, even if I'm looking for 1,700 in gold, you always have to identify what's my first problem and does the trade stand up just based on the first problem? Let's take a look. I'm getting long above these two swing lows. I've already got this poke higher. So what if price just went to this poke higher? Okay. 
I'm risking $1,400. I'm going to make $3,420. That's if it did it in one bar. The risk reward is 2.44. I'm looking for three. But this is not really the move I'm looking for, but this is enough that I'm, I'm willing to go ahead and take this. Also, if it takes any amount of time at all, because this my, I don't have my blue upsloper drawn in here because then I wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to see all this. If it takes any time at all, of course, it's blue upsloping, I'll make more and more money because the profit target will move higher with the slope. So it's a 2.44. Probably by the time it goes 10 bars, it's going to be a 2.7, 2.8. It's going to be close enough to my 3.0 that I'm going to be willing to take it because my ultimate target is 20 to 1. Something like that. We'll see at the end. I get long. Price does take out the internal high. And you can see it leaves lower highs. Makes a new high. Leaves lower highs. Pokes out and makes a new high. Yes, I'm outside of the upsloping blue parallel. Doesn't bother me at all. This is just time sliding to the right. It's a sign of strength that we've broken back inside of this lower parallel once we've been outside it. So everything's going just fine. It's, here's the problem. I can't hide underneath here yet. I'm too close to where price is. So in a lot of, a lot of sense, a lot of you are thinking, boy, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. I can't even go to break even yet. Now, if, I would recommend if you were trading this with a small account, not only should you be at break even, but you probably are should be protecting profits. But I'm looking for 1700. This is a difficult frame for a small account. So if I were you, I'd be at break even and or maybe even hiding under these double bottoms under here. For me, if I get profit stopped out here, or stopped out at break even, and it goes to 1700. As a fund manager for people, that, you know, I manage money that for a lot of a lot of money for for people, for for governments. That would be a big failure, because I'd be correct, and I wouldn't have the money, and there aren't that many opportunities. So I have to give it the opportunity to mature. With a smaller account, you can always get back in, and it's better for you to make sure you protect your capital and or take profits on a regular basis. So two different exercises going on here. Now you can see price continues to move higher and take out prior highs. Now we took out this higher high on the low, I mean on the left. We took out the C pivot and the B pivot on the left. No problem at all. We're back inside this blue upsloping median line and take a look we make a run Andrew Dr. Andrew Alan Andrews says 80% of the time we should make it to this blue median line that's the next most likely line you can see we turned and failed well we have a way to measure whether or not that's important we measure how far how close we got to it the excursion we just put it underneath so this undershoot we're going to put it underneath, yields this overshoot. We're just going to draw a line parallel to this blue line right here. And if this median line is still giving us the probable path of price, it's just, I'm, I'm waving my hand at the screen, you can't see it, sorry. This is just overshoot and undershoot, and this should be the support down here. It's as if this median line shifted, that's all. Again. I'm not going to answer questions and try and tra if you're if you're caught chatting, try and stay on on topic, please. So take a look. Here I am. I draw my parallel line. It's the same distance here as it is up here. And if this is meaningful, the only thing that happened is the median line has shifted down this amount. That's all. Not a big thing. It's like a sine wave shifting down in frequency. So let's see how price respects this overshoot. Price comes down, hits it, turns on a dime. We dance around it, price comes up, look where it stops. Right at 
our sliding parallel that gave us the original frequency, turns on a dime. So you can see that all this median line did was shift down this amount. Turns back down, stops, turns on a dime. Individual traders, you guys could be picking this trade off, taking your profit, getting along, back and forth and back and forth. A little harder for me on the amounts I do. Also, it depends on whether or not you had a stop. Down here, you had a stop. Up here, eh, not quite so sure. You'll have to decide. Again, we stopped at the outer parallel. Now we break above these highs. We've got double tops going. We break above these highs, and we're back above the lower parallel, another sign of strength. Now we go parabolic again. Remember down here? I mean, look how small it looks now. But remember when it turned up before, it looked huge. Well, now look at it. Price leaves an open gap. That's our first sign. And you can see we had lower highs and higher lows. So we were converging. Then all of a sudden we gapped higher, left double bottoms, and then went parabolic. And we're talking about big bars now. Now take a look, what did we do? We busted through this dotted sliding line that was working so well, and now we made the median line, which we're supposed to do 80% of the time. We finally see the median line. In a certain sense, this is a change in behavior. What does it tell us? Price has found some strength now. Okay, down here, a little bit lethargic, fell asleep, but the gap didn't get filled. We left double bottoms, and suddenly the market gets it, and price goes. People start to chase it. Price goes parabolic. Now we're not in 2008 when anything crazy is going on. Where we are is people are worried about inflation. I assume because of Greenspan had his his foot just nailed to the gas pedal. I don't know. It doesn't matter to me. Everything's in price. I'm just looking at price. I still have my original position on, and you can see, pay attention to this, I can finally start to trail stop orders. As we get far enough away, here's my first stop profit order, and I do it when it takes out this high. Here's my second stop profit order. When do I do that? When it takes out this high. That's as close as I can go. I still, I'm only at three, I don't know, 360, and we're all the way up to 540. I'm still leaving lots of money on the table, but I have to be careful. Again, if I get profit stopped out here and this thing goes to 1700 I fail. As a smaller trader, you don't. This is not a bad thing. Protect your profits. But for me, so you could be under here already, for example. For me, I need to be further back. It's harder for me to enter. So you can be one swing back. I try and be two swings back. So we've gone parabolic and we've broken through this sliding parallel. Signs of strength. See what it gives us. We get to the parallel. We just bust on through to the upper parallel. Now, we're going to use this later, so please pay attention to it one more time. Undershoot. We got it from here. Remember, we measured it from here. It worked perfect down here. When we bust through the median line, and by the way, this is the same size as well, it's all over the place. This is the amount of slop in this median line. The moment we bust through the median line, you can put this out here, draw the sliding parallel, and you've got your target. It's at least going there. And look at price go parabolic. It's a huge move. You know, if you're, uh, if you're a small trader, this, and you're not going to be sitting in this for a long time. By the way, we're now talking about being long at 2002. It's now... It's late, sorry, first quarter 2006. That's a long hold, isn't it? But I've got my target in mind, and I know where I'm going with this. So here we are. We've gone parabolic. Even this didn't contain price. That's another sign for me. This thing is stronger than it was down in here. We've shifted gears. We're at a whole new level. For those of you around for the, the physics lectures, the last three sessions, 
we've moved to the higher site state of excitement. Okay? Price has moved up. It's more excited. We blow through the upper sliding parallel quite a bit. Leave a high. Come all the way back down and retest. Here's our inside sliding parallel. Retest it perfectly. Twice. Head back up. And then once again, price goes parabolic. Look at it. So if you can look at it, it rests a little bit. It's a big rest. It's a wide rest, but it rests a little bit. Then it goes parabolic again. So don't you see that as the signature? Here it goes parabolic here. 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 So you can see it rest, go parabolic. Rest, go parabolic. Rest, parabolic. Rest, parabolic. Rest, parabolic. Now, for you guys, you guys can learn, go back and view this and draw it yourself. You can learn this back and forth and trade it. It's very tradable. Get long, get out of the parabolic. 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 Over and over and over again. It is tradable. If, if you have a larger position, it's less tradable. It's harder to turn the big bus around. But it's easy to mark. If you get nothing else from today, this and money management are going to be keys. Okay, so let's zoom in on this parabolic move and see just how big it is. Because it's a big move. We went from $264 where I'm long in six years. Actually, now we're at 2008. How about that? We went parabolic. See how we rested in here? We went parabolic, and this is the approximate high during the Hunt Brothers rally of silver and gold. Well, we had no problem going through that, did we? Price is strong like bull. Gold's at 1,000. We had no problem getting to 1,000. You know, lots of people that believe in quote-unquote natural numbers. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. No problem at all. So go parabolic. Look how big this run is. We're talking about 1,000 all the way back down to my stop is at 624. So I am trailing stops. But I'm talking about more than a $300 stop here. I'm leaving half my money on the table. But it's this balance, we'll talk about this in a second. I have to balance catching the move and protecting profits. It's very difficult. An observation. When price goes vertical, its rate of rise is not sustainable. Things cannot go vertical forever. Each parabolic move has been followed by a pullback to a structural base. Can that be used effectively? I would challenge each of you to go back. What? You're going to get these slides at the end when you leave. Take a look at the slides. If you want to do the homework, take a daily chart of gold yourself. Plot this out. And take a look at the parabolic moves and the pull up, pullbacks. The parabolic moves and the pullbacks. They're, they can be used very effectively. And especially if you're able to mark them out, you can get long when price is resting. When it goes parabolic, take your money off the table. Wait for it to rest. Get back in. Take When it goes parabolic, take your money off the table. It's a wonderful way to trade once you learn to understand what parabolic means. So let's see what happens here and what this means. And why, especially for a smaller account, taking the money off the table is a great thing. This one weekly bar is 115 bucks wide. That's a lot of do-re-mi. I'm still on 264. Price goes vertical. Well, that's good news. But when price goes vertical, it often leaves no swing highs or swing lows for you to hide logical stop or profit stops behind. My stop's got to be all the way down here, 630. 
We've been up above a thousand. My stock's at six thirty. So let's look back at it. Looking back at price action and market structure, price has moved from balance to extreme, to balance to extreme, to balance and extreme, and it's never once violated a swing low on this weekly chart, not once. The even pullbacks from the parabolic rises have respected their point of origin or point of ignition. So this is the point of origin right here, or the point of ignition, and it's parabolic, and we're starting to pull back. And look at this one. Here's our point of ignition. We've exploded, and we don't even come close to it. If you want to count this as the spawning point or point of ignition, we go parabolic. Do we take it out? Absolutely not. Once again, I challenge you. Go ahead and take a closer look, and you'll see each one of these parabolic moves. We don't take out any swing lows at all all the way up. Very unusual. That's why this campaign was worth staying in. It was work. But so far it's paying off. It's being I'm being paid well to be long. And I haven't taken any heat yet. Gold at a thousand. Here's the hunt rally. Look at this pullback. Thousand. Now we're all the way back to 775. Nice pullback. Do I like it? Well, I don't have to like it. Where's my stop? My stop's at the prior swing low. It's where price ignited. We're not there yet. I don't have to like it, but I'll pay attention to it. Now, what can I do to try and nail this down and figure out? where things are going. I can draw a downsloping red median line to give me the probable path of price. It also will help me with timing. Where am I likely to see this thing bottom out? Where will I be in, in trouble? Where will I be golden if it takes this downsloping median line out? All those things are going to help me. So as I look at this chart, we're already pretty much at or near vertically this lower parallel. A likely place for us to run into support right here. We would call this the nexus or the null point. Right at right where price ignited and right at the median line. Price, to me, the probable half the price has coming to the median line written all over it. Now, we've already made it once. But remember, price breathes, it oscillates. And this is a pullback. If it's not a pullback, I'm wrong. If we just blow through the bottom, I'm just dead wrong. But price should oscillate. And somewhere down here, we should find support. Let's see what we get. Let me mark out my thought. Let me, first, let me take a drink of tea. Pardon me. All right, so let me mark out my thoughts. Price can pull back to the prior tops of the multi-pivot line right here. See the tops here? If price pulls back here and that's all and gets, gets to the median line and these tops, then this is an opportunity for me. This is the probable path of price. If this is where we go and stop, this is an opportunity. If we go down here and take out these lows, and we're still on the probable path of price, this is no longer an opportunity. This is now a failure. I'm going to have to take my chips and walk away. The game's over. Okay? Here's the interesting thing. If I can do this logic and anticipate this pullback, I can use this to my advantage. So price rallied to a lower extreme, and the median line represents the probable path of price. I've got two possibilities here. 
If it stops at the stop line, the multi-pivot line here, off the tops, it's an opportunity. If it busts through and breaks through the bottom of this area of resting, this is the spawning pad, I'm in trouble. Other than knowing when I'm okay and when I'm in trouble, can I use this? Remember what I said. Amos taught me. If price has performed at halfway through the move, find a way to step up and put the rest of your capital on the table. Now, again, I'm talking about large long-term position trading, not intraday 10-minute trading, and also not trading one contract in a trending market. I'm talking about multiple contracts really with large accounts. But it doesn't mean you can't use this logic to anticipate moves. For example, let's say you weren't long gold. If you can learn to map this, you go ahead and practice this. Read the slides, practice this, draw it. This is an opportunity for you to get long with a very nice stop. If you don't have to be long gold. You miss long you miss the long, this is a great place to get long with a nice stop. That's another way to use it. Just because I'm listen, I'm what's called a whale, one of the three or four largest traders in the markets I trade. Just because you're not a whale doesn't mean you can't read, walk, talk, and trade like a whale. You can. It's not that hard. It just takes practice. So how can I use this? Amos says, if it performs at 50%, and it has, where's 50%? At the Hunt Brothers high. Because I think we're going to twice that. I've already been in this thing for six years. So I'm committed. Now I'm going to use Amos's logic. This is what he taught me. Halfway through, this is halfway, it's performed because we've, Busted through 850, and we're all the way to 1,000. Now we're getting a pullback. See it? I'm not scared. It's okay. I mapped it out. This is what the pullback should look like. This is an opportunity. Here's the line of death right here. So look, if this area truly is the fulcrum that produced a parabolic new high in gold, then this area should be the landing pad for the pullback in gold. Let me say it again. If this is the area that produced the parabolic move, the pullback should end here. If it blows through this area, this will be the first time since 2002 that we've taken out a swing low. And that will be a change in behavior and get me out. How can I use that? I draw in a blue upsloping median line. I use the low from the spawning pad where it went parabolic to the highest high. And I don't even have price over here yet. I can draw it before price gets here. Why? Because this is where price should land. If it doesn't land here, none of this matters. So I'm going to put my C pivot right here right at the median line, even though price isn't here yet, and say, hey, if I'm right, this is the probable path of price. So you've just watched me draw a median line before price was anywhere near getting there. I'm using logic to anticipate where the next pivot is likely to be, okay? Price comes up, and where does it get rejected? It, get re it gets rejected right at the confluence or the area where they cross the downsloping upper parallel and the blue upsloping median line of what I think is the probable price. That also gives me some confidence about this blue median line that's kind of drawn in space. I don't really have a C P of it yet, but I... I think this is important. How am I going to know? I'm going to know what the next bar. If the next bar heads up, the blue line probably is not meaningful. If this holds, the blue line is meaningful, and the red's still meaningful. 
look at all the touches right at the median line on this blue. And remember, I've got at that point when I drew this, I had nothing going on over here. This blue median line is doing exactly what it's supposed to be. The red's still okay, too. We've traded back within it. But the blue line is what I'm going to need. And it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. And I drew it, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 weekly bars, 13 weeks. I drew this thing in 12 to 13 weeks before we were close to this area. The logic of spawning pad and balance. So going from balance to extreme to balance allowed me to pick this out 12 weeks in advance. If I do my math, 12 weeks is a quarter. I think that's correct. So this is my current stop profit order. If price breaks below this spawning pad, I'm going to close out my position and keep what profits are left. That would be a major change in behavior. Here's the Amos statement. Keep the cheese, let me out of the trap. So whatever's left, you can have the stop and just give me whatever's left. It's a scary drop, but this should be the landing pad right here. And believe me, people see these three weekly bars. Nobody wants to buy get long here. Are you kidding me? It looks awful. As a whale, this is buying wholesale. When things are at a price that you can't believe, that especially if you have a stop, and I've got a stop right in front of me. If I've got a stop right in front of me and this thing is dropping like a stone, that's exactly when I want to get in. It's right where I wanted it. I'm a couple bars early, but that's okay. The blue line is showing its worth. We're right at the landing pad. Our stops underneath the spawning pan. Let's see what we can do. This is where it comes down to it, boys and girls. Do you believe in your work? And when do you trust your lines? It all comes down to this. If you want to be a trader, at some point, you have to have a plan. you got to have it written down. And you have to believe in it. And then you have to execute it. If you can't do that, you're just gambling. You're just looking for the action. Me, I'm a speculator. You can ask Barbara. She's been around me a very long time. You can ask people at Chicago Mercantile Exchange. I have my coat. In fact, I just got a brand new coat. My, I've, been, I've had my jacket since 1980, and I've been trading longer than that. I'm a speculator. I trust my lines. I trust my work. You have to come to a point where you trust your lines. If that's the case, let's look at it. Price has moved from balance to extreme and is now just above the price of origin that spawned the parabolic move. This area should be an area of balance. I'm willing to risk additional capital based on my work and my lines. This is what Amos taught me. It's performed at 50%. Now it's time to put the other half on. It's time to put it on. It's going to work or it's not going to work. But if it's going to work, this is actually your last chance to buy in. And that's when you want to buy in. I've got a nice stop here at balance. This is the spawning pad. Here's our landing pad. Yeah, it's a scary looking drop, no doubt about it. But the stop is built and it's perfect. It's everything I want. It performed. The logic worked. It's right where it should be. I've got a nice stop. This is now the stop profit order for the current long gold position, as well as the initial stop loss order for the new long gold position if I get long. If price breaks below the spawning pad right here, I'm going to close out my position and keep whatever profits are left. That would be a major change in behavior. I'll answer questions afterwards. This will be explicit. You'll understand. Okay. I put an order in, and I get hit. I'm long. And you can see we're clustering right at the 
See it? See the median line? It did its job perfectly. I'm right at the landing pad. I got long there. Now, my stop profit order for the current original long gold position, as well as the new initial stop loss order for the new long gold position is right here, just above 625. If price breaks below the spawning pad, I'm gonna close my position and keep what profits are left. That's gonna be a major change of behavior. So I'll make a nice profit on the initial position and I'll take a small loss on the add. Okay? I don't want, listen, just follow along. I, I know you're trying to help. Do me a favor, just relax. Follow along. You'll see the logic, okay? You'll see it, it's only gonna work one way. This comes from, I don't know, you know, I've been trading 42 years. This comes from not only trading 42 years, it comes from spending four years with Amos and having pounding it into my head. It comes from 17 years of trading with Dr. Andrews and having him pound, he used to call me pansy when I was a little boy, when I was a teenager, and pounding it into my head, okay? I know this material. I know what works. I know what doesn't work for me. So just pay attention. It may work differently for you. Exactly. Oh, I see. How are you, my brother? Uh, I've got some other friends here that study with Dr. Andrews. They come to all of these, and I always appreciate when they come and support me. All right, so let's see. We're going to go through the risk reward in three different ways on this position. Are you ready? Just try and, just try and stick with me here now. It's not heavy math. Don't worry about it. But I want you to think about it in three different ways. This is what makes it work. So there's my drink of tea. Here we go. I was taught by Amos that risk-reward is the engine that drives consistent long-term profits. Let's consider the new long gold position. This is the brand new position. I'm going to get long gold at 701, and my initial stop loss order is below the spawning pad area at 631. Okay? Although my premise for this trade is a profit target at double the high of the Hunt Brother Rally, which is at 1700, this trade has to still be evaluated against the initial hurdles it faces if it rallies from here. The most conservative case would be a test of the last upper pivot right here at 936. I'm risking 70 bucks. I'm getting long at 701. My stop's 631. Is that the wrong third? And at 936, I'll have a potential pro, uh, $235 in profit if I get up here, giving me a risk reward of 235 divided by 70 equals 3.36. So this more than meets my criteria of three to one. That's on the new position. If I make it to the second area, which is this high, I'm risking still 70 bucks. It's $289 divided by 70. So my risk reward is 4.13. If I only make it to this highest high, just above 1,000, it's $333. The risk reward is 4.76. Very nice. And we're not talking about 1,700. We're just talking about if this is all I get. So it holds up. That's on the new position. Let's look at the original long gold position. Each one of these have to, has to stand on their own, okay? So again, I'm going to myelinate. I'm going to go over it. I know it's going to sound repetitious, but that's the best way for you to learn. I was taught by Amos that risk-reward is the engine that drives consistent long-term profits. And by the way, a minimum of three to one is the key. Now let's consider the original long gold position. I'm long gold at 264.5. My current stop profit order is now below the spawning pad area at $631, right here. Although my premise for this trade is a profit target at double the high of the Hunt Brothers Rally at 1700 this trade will be evaluated and it must hold up under the scrutiny of dynamic risk reward against the hurdles it faces if it rallies further from here. The most conservative case would be a test 
of the last upper pivot, again, at 936. And think about it this way. Forget that I'm long at 264 and a half. And pretend I'm long. I've got profits up here. Let's pretend I'm long at 701. This would be the most conservative way to think about this position. In that case, my profit would be 235. I'd be risking $70 to the stop of potential profits that I already have. And my risk reward is 3.36. If it makes it to the next level, my risk reward is 4.13 and I make $289. If I make it to the highest high, 333, risk reward 476. We have to look at each leg of this separately. Now let's look at it one other way. Let's combine the positions, the averages. And again, I'm going to myelinate. I'm going to ingrain it so you get it. I was taught by Amos that risk-reward is the engine that drives consistent long-term profits. If you get nothing else, if you're a long-term trader, out of this, then learning about risk-reward, your trading will improve dramatically. Let's consider the combined long-term gold position. I'm long gold at 264 and a half, and I added at 701. My profit stop order is below the spawning pad area at 631. Although my premise for this trade is a profit target at double the high of the Hunt Brothers rally at 1700, this trade must still be evaluated against the initial hurdles it faces if it rallies from here. Now look, you've got to protect your profits. You've got to protect your capital. If you're a small trader and you're getting long here, you're one lot, you've got to have a stop loss. You always have to have a stop loss in the market. You must always protect yourself. Please, never trade without a stop loss. I'll tell you what, if you learn nothing else from me today other than you must always have a stop loss. You, that's the, I'll be happy if one person learns that. I'll have given something back to the market. This will keep you from blowing up your account. But so many people say, I know, I'll know when to get out, and they don't put it in the market, and then they're freezing as it turns lower. Put the stop loss in the market and leave it, period. The most conservative case would be a test of the last upper pivot, again, at 936. I'm risking 70 bucks. And at 936, I will have a potential $453 if I provide do the average, because the average price on the combined long gold position is $483. I'm long at 483 now, which is 264 plus 701 divided by two. That's my average. All right. If I get up here, I'll have made $453, which is a risk reward of 6.47. If I make it to the next high, I'll have made $507, which is a risk reward of 7.24. These are magnificent risk reward numbers, by the way. If I get up to this level, I'll make 551, which is a risk reward of 7.87. But remember, I'm actually looking for 1700. But I have to consider what happens at each one of these highs because we could fail anywhere here. And if we do, what's my risk reward? So I have to look at each leg of the position, including the combined leg, and say, does it make sense? And yes, all three make sense. All three ways to look at this make sense. And the risk reward is well above three and works great. So I'm good to go. I've added here. I'm long my original position at 264 and a half. My average price is 483. As Amos says, if it performs at that 50% level of where you think it's going, it's time to find a way to get in your second half. Well, I didn't just buy here. I waited for a pullback. I've got a logical pullback. We haven't violated one swing low on the left. Here's my pullback right above a swing low. I'm going to get along my second unit right here. And if it finally does break a swing low, I'll chuck the whole thing and take what money's left and be happy. The campaign's over. But first it's gonna to have to take this low out. Let's see what happens. Price comes down. 
You can see it pull up. Doesn't make it to my first high. Then it makes a pullback. Please save your questions. Makes a pullback. This is really important stuff. Okay, you're going to miss it if you're busy typing and arguing. It makes a pullback. It doesn't make it to my prior high. This is my first pullback. Here's my buy. You can see we had a spike low with a nice close. So I'm actually buying on the retest by the way, Vikas. I'm long on the retest. Price comes up, makes its first pullback. Now we're going to project that forward with the same angle as the lower parallel. And that's going to be called the maximum line, the line of maximum excursion. We use this all the time. It's really important stuff. It's very similar to the sliding parallel down below that was respected. But it's got some mathematics involved in it. Let's see what happens. Price does actually get back up to this prior high. It gets up to this prior high. And now where are we? We're at the median line. And Andrew says 80% of the time we'll make it to the median line. At the median line, we'll either accelerate or reverse. Okay, let me say it again. Price will make the median line 80% of the time. At the median line, we'll either accelerate or reverse. If we reverse, this line of maximum excursion is going to hold any pullback. If it doesn't, I'm probably in trouble. So let's pay attention to this line of maximum excursion. Here we go. This is where it was spawned. We make a high. We pull back and leave triple bottoms. We don't quite make it, but that's close enough for jazz for me. Lower high. What are we doing? We're resting. We're at balance at the moment. We were at extreme to balance to extreme back to balance. Look at us now at the line of maximum excursion. Resting, touch, touch. Resting, touch, touch. Price should run out of downside directional energy at the line of maximum excursion. And it does. And it does. Let this soak in. First pullback. Copy the slope of the lower parallel. Slide it up to the first pullback. It should contain price on the way down. Now we run up. We're back at the median line once again. And this is the first time we've closed above this median line. It's not much of a close above it, but I'll take anything. It makes me happy. I'm not going to lie. I've been in this trade. Look, it's, 2000, it's late 2009. I've been in this trade for seven years now. And I've doubled up, which is unusual for me. But this is how Amos taught me to campaign trade. The first time I'm showing this publicly. It's the first time anybody's seen Amos's work publicly. But I wanted to do this for you guys today because I know it's the 25th and 50th anniversary of gold and silver on the CME. It's the perfect time to unload this on you. And then I'm going to give you one other trade afterwards that was just magnificent. I know this is going to be a little bit long, Cynthia. I hope you have uh, something to munch while we finish. But we, we won't take that many questions because this is such a long presentation. But there's, stud, take this one home and study this one, guys. Again, it's the very first time. I've been able to do this, and there is no other Amos material out there. Line of maximum excursion, one more time. First pullback. I grab the slope from the lower parallel. I copy it. I just grab it and put it on to the lowest, to this first pullback, project it forward. That's all I do. And you can see Price loves it. Comes down, touches it. Thank you. Thank you. Holds. Blows forward. Now we're at the median line. In a certain sense, we've kind of gone parabolic, haven't we? We had another landing pad. We've gone parabolic again. We really shouldn't see the swings. We shouldn't back up and take any of these out for several reasons. First of all, we've got this beautiful line of maximum excursion. It's going to hold anything that falls off. Second of all, 
we've got beautiful swings for me. This swing held up great. It allowed me to get long. Now we've got some interior swings for me. We're only halfway there, so I can't answer questions yet. So just slow. We're up above the median line for the first time. Here's our first close above the median line. We poke above it. Now we break back below. Where do we go? We're trying to go right to the line of maximum excursion and take it out. We can't get there. We go right back to the median line. We got a battle going here. We can't get above the median line. We get back down to the line of maximum excursion. The maximum excursion line should provide solid support. It has in the past. It should now. I just draw a slanted line off of these tops. Here's my question. This is just to myself. Is this a trend barrier? Is this it? It looks ominous because before we could make it above the median line. Now we're not making it above the median line. The whole key to this is whether or not the line of maximum excursion stops price cold and turns it, okay? Let's look now. This slanted line was worrying me. Here's my line of maximum excursion. So much for my slanted line. In fact, the slanted line that was resistance becomes support. We go back up to the median line, poke above it, poke above it, pull back. Where do we go? Right to the slanted line. So this is a multi-pivot line that just has a slight bit of slope. And now it works like a charm. It's also working for me. So now I've got swings building and holding. I've got the line of maximum excursion holding. I've got my slanted multi-pivot line that was resistance, it's now support. Now it's working. Now it's time to add another piece to the picture. I copy this undershoot, which is the maximum line of excursion, and I put it over the top, just as I did before. If we make a run higher, a parabolic run higher, we should be going right to this green line, which is, once again, I copied the distance from the maximum line of excursion back to the lower parallel, take that distance, put it above the upper parallel, Copy the same slope. In a certain sense, this is the upside maximum excursion. It's the reflection of the maximum excursion. If you're lost, don't worry about it. You're going to get the slides at the end. You can watch this recording a thousand times, okay? There's a lot of material in here. I don't expect everybody to get it the first time, second time, third time through. This is the first time, and I mean this sincerely, this is the first time this has ever been shown publicly, okay? I finally have handcuffs off, okay? So I, I, I feel so happy that I can actually show you guys. People have been asking for Amos' work forever. I finally get to show it. All right, so watch what happens. Price goes to balance again. How many times have we seen this? Balance, parabolic, balance, parabolic, balance, parabolic, balance, parabolic. Balance, parabolic. Now, this is for all of you. Pay attention. We're now at my target. Roughly double the Hunt Brothers rally high at 1,700. We've gone from balance to parabolic. Do you want to take your profits here? You can answer now. Go ahead. Okay, I tighten stops, I take half. What's your plan? I'm taking them off, I'm not taking them off. Trading plan 1700, all good answers. Take some, let the rest run. Those are all good answers. If nothing else, you better be running profit stops, right? Correct? Boy, if you've got a plan, stick to a plan, sure. Now, what do you think price is going to do? Let's, let's go there. Let price answer the question. Ed, I like that one. Michael says, I have no idea. I like that one, too. That's really what Ed is saying. I don't know. Let, let price answer the question. 
Upper line is the target. Go to the upper green. Anybody else? Hi, Phil. How are you? Go to the top blue line or even the green. Hit the upper blue median line, upper green. The last two swings were symmetrical. Go, okay, so I've got you involved. I've got people thinking, okay? There's no wrong answer. What I want to just make sure is it's a, somebody, now somebody saying, let's, let's, it'll pull back after the parabolic. All right, good. I got you involved. That's what I'm going to make sure. Move your stop loss up. Great. I'm not going to answer questions. Hang on. How did I, I – I'll answer that at the end, okay? Let me just – I just want to make sure that you're all involved, and everybody is involved. Thank you. Okay, now, let's see where price goes. Did you take profits here? Nothing wrong with that. I'm watching the line of maximum excursion working like a charm. And we've seen this twice. We saw it down below as well, remember? So we've seen this work twice. I've got profit stops right here. So I'm not giving away that much. I'm willing to go for the extra bit. We did this live. We put this out live at Market Geometry as well as, you can go back and look, at the IB seminars, we did three gold seminars. You can see this actual median line and chart from 700 bucks that gave the high 1850-ish, two years before it got there. We put it out there in three seminars. We said, we think gold's gonna go here and it's probably gonna run out of steam. And why? Because of the way this median line performed. Let's see what happens. We're out at 1845 and a half. Now, what's your profit target? Some of you said 1700. That was the plan. I have no problem with that. Some of you said tighten up your stops. Great. I have no problem with that. Have a plan. Doesn't matter. Have a plan. Where are you hiding your profit stops if you're not out? Now, here's an important question for you. Has price broken a swing low yet since 2002? Profit target met at 1845 and a half, which gives me a profit of 1,362.2 per contract. I'm trading bullion, by the way. And I was trading double my normal size, which is unusual for me. The actual realized risk reward is at least 19 to half, 20, 20 to 1. But really, if, at this point, it's meaningless to even think about it or calculate it. It's parabolic. You're only going to see these trades. You'll see these trades three or four times in your career if you trade 30 years. How about that? I've cornered four markets. I've been on four corners. One of them was the Hunt Brothers. And I've done one on my own, all by myself. That was, I stopped the Belgian government's currency from trading for four days. So I've seen some of these, but you don't see them very often. And I'm not, nobody cornered the gold market. Okay, it just went parabolic. And the government didn't have to step in. People just got very, very long. Let's see what happened. Profit target met at 1845 and a half. Now, if you're still long, you could still be long. Support is still holding. The swings are still holding. Have we taken any lower swing out yet? Absolutely not. It's a mega trend. Yes, Johnny. Where, if you're still long, where are you hiding your profit stops? Has price broken a swing low yet? I will tell you that at this point at market geometry, there were people that were long lots of gold, and they were thinking, 2,500, 5,000, whatever. As long as you have a plan, as long as you're protected, that's fine. Here's a big picture. We had this up again. We did this live on IB. Three, there's three gold seminars prior to this. Go back and take a look. and they, they're, they're marked gold seminars. And you can see us trading this. You can see us getting long 
down here. I, I didn't give, I can't give away the Amos information back then, but we use them as separate traits. Reflected line of maximum excursion hits it. I mean, oh, do we leave some money on the table? Yeah, 50, 60 bucks. This is the longest campaign trade or portfolio style trade that I have ever been involved in. It should be noted that I was also long physical rare earth and metals, tons of them, which can be highly correlated with precious metal. And by long, I mean I took actual delivery in a warehouse. Although there was a $300 pullback in a vertical run up of over 400 bucks, price managed to run $1,600 higher without ever breaking below two higher swing lows on the left, which is a measure of just how relentless this run higher. In fact, if you look at the weekly, I don't think we broke one swing low. Extra credit. What phase is the market in now? Are we in an uptrend, a downtrend, or a range? Hang in there, Cynthia. Let's go to the next part. Let's see how well gold does now that it's reached my post Hunt Brothers rally target. It met my rally, it exceeded my rally. Now what is gold going to do? And we showed three trades in this next area that I'm gonna show you. I'm only gonna go through one of them. Yeah, we, Elizabeth, you're right. We still have not broken through any prior spawning point, right? Let's see, this is not Amos. This is me just normal portfolio trading. I exited the portfolio longs at 18.45 and a half. It was funny, Cynthia had to send me five slides in a row back because I can't spell portfolio. I spelled portfolio five different ways in five, sl five slides. That's how tired I was on Sunday night. And I, I tell you what, I don't even know how I could, the, the way I, it was amazing how he misspelled these words, this word, just only this one word. So exit the portfolio longs at 1845 and a half. Now, after the last parabolic move, gold settles into a rather quiet range that is ma marked by flat bottoms, see them? Then the top of the range is not clear yet. I don't really know, because we haven't taken out any lows, so I don't know where the top is. Are we still looking for the top? Have we made the top? I won't know until we've done something. We're back in that time. The top of the range is not clear yet. After making two runs higher and turning lower from the same area, price began a slow orderly descent, which is this move right here. But we haven't broken through anything at all. And thank you all for sticking around late because I know this is going long, but this is a ton of information, but I feel like I'm free. I can finally show you some stuff. After this trade, I'm gonna show you another Amos campaign, which is just a hoot, just a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun on this one. Okay, so here we go. Notice that I turned this line from red. This is my own working chart. I'm looking at it, and I went, you know, and now this is subtle. This line should be blue because I've got higher lows. Then I see this bar pop. Look at it, I've got three higher lows, and then all of a sudden we pop the double tops and close on our high. And I, got, I sit up and I go, hey, wow, look at this. So this bar catches my attention. The way I generally trade when I chart, I'll wander through all of this. I got nothing to do here. I, even though we had double tops here, didn't, didn't catch my fancy. Even though I had double bottoms here, didn't work for me. Even though I'm back at the test of this area, maybe I got to stop below here, but it wasn't enough for me. The light bulb didn't come on. When this bar popped, all of a sudden, I go ding, 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 ding. I know what I want to do. The light bulb went on. Let's show, let me show you. One bar later, I enter orders into the market. I want to get long gold at 1556 and a half. 
back down here with an initial stop loss at 15.16 and a half. My profit target will be slightly below the prior near double tops at 17.67 and a half. I'm risking $40 to make a potential $211. That gives me a risk reward ratio of 5.3 to 1. Okay? This is not a campaign trade. It's not a chip shot. This is a nice little portfolio trade. All right? Look, look, okay, we're back from answer. Now we're going to answer questions at the end now because we've got lots of slides. We're only halfway there. Trust me. And you're going to want to see the rest. So price comes down and I get long. 15, 56 and a half. Stop is 40, 40 bucks lower. Profit target, 200 and whatever I said higher. 17, 67 and a half. I spell portfolio right. <laughs> All right. Price comes up. It, it just does a nice orderly march. I'm never in any trouble. The only thing that's odd about this one, there's never a stop. Look, it's higher bar, higher bar, higher bar, higher bar, higher bar. There's never an opportunity to put a stop in this market. Take care, Paul. There's never an opportunity. There's nothing I can do about that. I can put a profit floor if I want. For example, I could have, once we broke here, put a profit stop right here and just said, you know what, I'll keep some of the money if that's where, if that's where we turn back. But at this point, remember, I'm running with lots of money in the gas tank. It hits my profit target at 17 dollars and a half. I take my money, I cancel my initial stop, I'm done, thank you. It wasn't the fastest trade in the world, but it's, this is a nice, normal trade. Now, are you ready? Is, is, are you, have you had enough, or do you actually want to see a really fun trade? I'm going to use Amos's technique again, and... I'm going to push the market off the slope. How about that? I'm going to drive this market. So that's a little bit of Amos and, and a lot of me, okay? And this comes from years of being – Amos was never one of the largest traders in the market. He was never a whale. He was, he was a centimillionaire when I knew him from trading, so he made lots of money. But – he was never, you know, one of the biggest traders in any of the markets he traded. He just was a very good trader. I'm a, a, one of the biggest traders in most of the markets I trade. There are times when I can dominate a market. So let's, let's watch. We make a series of lower highs after a climax high. So we've got one drive to the top, two drives to the top, three drives to the top. You know I took profit right in here, so I'm paying attention. And thank you for staying up in Australia. I know it's way early. I appreciate it. You'll get more. This next one is lots of fun. Let me just tell you. And, we again, I showed this one live. We do a session called Breakfast with the Master. Um, it's live. People get to ask questions. There's a very limited number of people let in. And um, we have a ton of fun. Um, you can show charts, you can ask me to draw stuff, and you can follow trades live. So it's a lot of fun. So we watched this one live, and it was a lot of fun. In the middle of one of these sessions, I actually had to go take my – I just said, you know what, I have to mute myself. I have to go take profits in a position. So I, I muted myself for two minutes while I called out and took my profits. So that, that's how in tune – I mean, I get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and trade, and then I start teaching at 6. I teach from 6 to about – that goes from about 6 to 8, 8.30. Then I have about an hour and a half where I trade. And then I teach again from 11 to 12.30 or so. Then I finish up trading. I'm out of the bad cave of the trading room at 4.30. So that some of the days can get long. So here we are. We made three highs after this climax high. We've got a downsloping median line. We've still got higher lows. What's going on here? Let's pull back a little bit and take a look. 
there seem to be buyers at these levels. Is it ominous that price tried three times to break above the climax high, one, two, three, and instead left three highs at about the same area? Is that an ominous sign? Or, here's another way to look at it, is price simply moving from the upper median line and or its sliding parallel, which is this reflected line of maximum excursion, back to the lower parallel or the original line of maximum excursion. So those are the possibilities. Are there buyers here? Am I worried that these three highs are sitting in front of me and we haven't made it to new highs? Or are we simply sliding over to the line of maximum excursion and or this lower parallel? We have to sort that out before we trade. So again, I'm willing to sit and sort things out, even on a weekly. This is a daily, but when we go back to weeklies or dailies, whatever we're going to trade off of, I'm willing to sort it out until the light bulb goes on. And that's what makes me such a good trader is I don't have impulsive trades. Those, been, those were beat out of me a long time ago. I wait until the light bulb comes on, then I commit capital. Price leaves a lower high, and then we finally break below a lower low. Now, here's something I missed. I said I can't seem to get a clear picture of where price is headed in my head. Maybe it's time for me to remove the upsloping median line set. Sometimes you have lines on your charts so long that you get glued to them and you can't see clearly. Here's something I missed. See if anybody can pick it up. I, I'm breaking below the maximum excursion line. Yes, I'm making similar lows, but this maximum excursion line, which has been golden, it's starting to break up. And... You know, when I, when I actually put the slides together, I didn't really pay too much attention about it. But look at it. We blew right through it. It's not holding anything at all. Tested it once, came up, made a lower high, blew right through it. Maybe this thing's in trouble. I don't know. We'll see. Let's, let's, let's get rid of the upsloping lines and start over and see what we see. So I pull the upsloping lines off, and I take a look, and I say, hey, hey what, what if this is the high? And what if the one, two, three matters? And I draw a median line set from this high to the landing pad. Remember this? To the highest high, which is three. So that gives me the width of this whole move. We call this the width median line. Once I remove the upsloping median line set and its parallels, a crystal clear image formed in my mind. And I knew just where I wanted to execute a short gold position. All of a sudden, I could see it clear. The moment I erased everything, it was instantly clear. Hey, draw on this high, this low, this high. See what you get. Okay, I've got a test already of this upper parallel, and we're starting to take lows out. Here's our swing low. Come back up, and we're trying to start. They're smaller swings, but they're important. We tested this upper parallel. It held. Now we're taking lows out. What do I want to see? I'm not going to just sell at the market. I, I, you know, stops are too expensive. I also want to see price action. I want to see price come back to this upper parallel. I want to see it fail. Then I'm willing to get short. I'm picky. I know I'm asking for a lot, but I want to put a lot of money on the line. And it gets a lot, of more, a lot more interesting in a second. Watch what happens. Price does exactly what I want. Take a look. Makes a lower low, rallies up, makes a lower low. Now we come right back up to the upper parallel. This is exactly what I wanted. This is exactly what I pictured in my mind. A further show of weakness, followed by a rally to the upper MLH parallel right here, and then a sell-off. Now I need a rally to retest the parallel so I can go short with a stop. I see it. I get rid of the upsloping median lines. I draw on down slipping lines. Suddenly, I can see it, and I get exactly what I see. So I'm willing to put capital on the board. Looks like this. I'm going to sell a retest of this upper parallel, and I'm going to put my initial stop above the prior high. It's that simple. 
minimum profit target. I have to have a profit target before I can do risk reward. Is of course the landing pad over here on the left, where I got long before. Let's see. I believe a break below 1525 may lead, pay attention to this, may lead to a $250 sell off in gold. Now, gold is still up at almost 1700 but I believe a break below 1525 may lead to a $250 sell off. Just looking, there are no indicators, just looking at price. If this gives way, my lines of maximum excursion are no longer working. If this gives way, we're, we have clean air down here, and I think we've got 250 bucks to the downside. But this trade must stand on its minimum expectation. How many times have I said this today? Where is it likely to first have trouble? Right here at the landing pad. If the risk-reward is better than 3 to 1 there, then the trade will stand on its own. The risk-reward on this trade is 6.7 to 1. There is no indicator. It's just lines. This is a median line. It's, it's on every charting tool in the world. I'm going to get short. Actually, I do get short. At the parallel, my stop's up above. My minimum target is at the landing pad. I'm risking 1830 bucks to make 12250 that's the minimum, but I think we could fall 250 bucks further than this if this gives away. How about that? So we're back into campaign mode. We're back into Amos mode. We can and we can finally talk about it. And this trade was not that long ago. Did you all see the big fall in gold? Well, watch it unfold in front of you, and watch it through my eyes now. Watch me hunt it, watch me stalk it, watch me add, and watch me push and shove. How about that? Okay, I get short at seven at seventeen, sorry, sixteen eighty three and a half, and my stops at seventeen oh one eighty. Price is making lower highs and lower lows, and now if it is, now it's beginning to pick up speed to the downside. If I can find an acceptable area, I even want to add more to my positions. Look at the lower lows. Lower lows, rally, lower lows, rally, lower lows. Now we are really starting to sprint. I've got a lot of money in this. We're below 1600 I'm short at 1683 Seems like a lot of money. 83 bucks in gold is a lot of money. But I'm nowhere, nowhere, nowhere near done. Now, I get a call from my investors. First time they see me, see anybody in their portfolio, they have 16 major traders in their portfolio. They have over 100 traders, but 16 major traders. Nobody is short gold. I'm the only person short gold. They've got a lot of interest in gold. They want to let me know that if I'm interested don't be shy about using leverage. In fact, use all the leverage you want. They're encouraging me to go ahead and use my maximum leverage, which is really a big position. Because when they asked me what I thought, which they very seldom do, I said, I think if it breaks 15 and a quarter, we may go to, ready? 12.50 in gold. My original concept was if we break 1500 I'll sell a retest of the area and take my profits just above 1250 but I'm already short and this thing is falling like a stone now my investors would like to be even shorter because no one else is even playing nobody's short if anything they're long it's okay with me because I like it I like this position a lot. It's performing exactly as I want. And now I've got Amos's work on my side. So I know just what to do. I've got a lower high 
lower low again. Price has behaved exactly as I described it, and although I'm short one unit of gold, I would like to be short several more units. I can't even tell you how many. Now price has tested support at 1550. Here's our big support. Everybody's talking about 1550 is going to hold, and there's no way price is going to go below 1550. I'm in a private tweet with the top 50 fund managers. 1550 is golden. Buy all you want at 1550. It's going to make 2000. Everybody's sure it's going to hold. Price has tested support at 1550, and now it's rallying back. And to me, it's rallying back to a sell area. I have no idea what people are looking at. I don't care. What I care about is what's right in front of me, which is price. Price is making lower highs, lower lows. Lower highs, lower lows. Lower highs, lower lows. Lower highs, lower lows. It's moving from balance to extreme. Balance to extreme. Balance to extreme. I think we're heading out to extreme again. And extreme, I want to get short. Price rallied and tried to pull back to the upper median line and failed. We couldn't even make it now to the upper median line. It's made it all three times. This time, it can't even get there. This is a sign of weakness. When price turns lower again, I draw in a red downsloping median line set measuring the path of price. I don't like this one because look how steep it is, but that's how fast price is falling. And sometimes price does what it wants to do. It doesn't, want, it doesn't ever do what you want. It does what it wants to do. And if this train is going to leave, sometimes it leaves when it wants to leave, not when you want it to leave. The drop from 1680 to 1560 was vertical. See it? So I know from all the years I've been spent charting that a modified shift median line, which is down 50% over 50% for the A point, will do a better job projecting the probable path of price. Now I see the orders I want to work in the market. You can see my initial position. Now I know the light bulb comes on. I know exactly what I want to do. Here we go. I want to be short at 1608. I want to add. And my initial stop is going to be 1618.1, just above this C level. And also, you can see it's a nice little multi-pivot line. None of these have given away in the past. I don't think this one will either. But think about this. Once again, it has to stand on its own. I'm already short at 1683 and a half. I want to get short at 1608 even. And when price goes down to the median line and pulls back, I'm selling again at 1589 and a half. Now I can't leave my stop up here. I'd be losing a lot of money. This is the day of reckoning. This is why I'm still here after all these years. I've never blown an account out because I can't leave my stop up here. If I'm going to add here and here, I have to move my combined stop right here. It's close to the action. I'm not going to be happy if it got stopped down, but I have got to protect myself, my capital, and my investor's capital. So my stop's at 1618, even though my combined average is not much higher than this. I got about a $27 profit is all I'm going to have if I get taken out. But I can't leave my stop up here. I just managed to get rid of this third portion of the short gold. I'm really kind of pushing this market. When price quickly zooms to the downside, I've sold so much at this point, people are, their 1550 is just, it's, it's falling out of their pockets. Price zooms to the downside. If anyone felt the 15 to 100 area would act as support, it's quickly obvious there was nothing but stop loss orders at this level. Take a look at what happened in one day. Goodbye. I got short, it never came back, and then it fell apart. I did get short all I wanted to get short, but I barely got short, and I had to chase it. Uh, 
Um, somewhere we have this. Let, let me go back one second. Let me just make this clear. You see this downsloping black median line? Everybody see this? This is the median line right here. And Dr. Andrews says with 80% probability, we're going to the median line, okay? So what better target to have than the median line? I get all loaded up, price falls apart. Now remember, what happens to a market when it goes vertical? It goes parabolic and then what happens? It goes from extreme, which is parabolic, to what? It comes back to balance. If it goes to extreme and I'm this loaded up, I want my money. I told everybody I wanted 250 bucks out of this. I'm, I'm going to get my 250 bucks. Take a look. Price, this is the median line right here. This is the upper parallel. Here's the median line cutting right here. Price got to the median line. I took my money because it's likely to come back to rest. Let me take my money. I've, I'm so short, I also have to buy on a bar when everybody else is trying to sell. Otherwise, I'm going to have to chase it higher. That's how short I am. That's how much I have on. Everybody in the world was trying to sell this bar, whether they were short or finally getting it and trying to go short. Excuse me, whether they were long and puking or whether they finally got it and were trying to get short. This is the kind of bar that I have to take my profit on. So after clearing my charting senses, I had a good idea of what might happen if gold broke below the 1550 area decisively. I initially got short at 1701.80, and as price accelerated to the downside towards the 1550 level, I looked for areas to add to my position, which is unusual for me. Again, I'm using Amos's method. After price tested the 1560 area, I sold the next rally against an upper MLH at 1608. And then once price broke below the 1550 area right here the first time, I said, you know what, these people are all going to get caught. I was able to sell the next touch up here of the same downsloping upper median line parallel at 1589 and a half. I just got it off before it fell. My average price on my gold sale was 1627. So you can see my stop was at 1618. I only had nine bucks if I'd gotten stopped down. After my second sale, I moved my combined profit stop to 16.18, 10. I took profit right above the downsloping median line at 13.52.5 for a total profit of 274.5, which is a tremendous profit for really it's a very short-term trade for this kind of move. I told my investors 250. I took out 274.5 because I got in early on the first portion. Let's see what happened. Price came back to, it's coming back to balance, isn't it? I wish you had this webinar earlier. Actually, I'm kind of sad because I had prepared these charts for, we also do something called eating with the master for long-term trading. And I was, I was hoping that it was going to unfold live while we were doing this. And unfortunately, it's, Price does what it wants. Timing is not always wanted. But we're, hang on, I got something for you for the future. Okay, I'm going to put you in a position. And it can be this kind of position. Don't kid yourself. Okay? All right, so price comes back to balance. Okay, before we go to beans, Julie just mentioned, isn't it interesting that gold's right back down to 1350, which is also a base of support before another leg down? Well, it's going to be interesting, Julie. Here's the interesting part for me. My initial thought, Julie, was that I would sell a retest at 1500 once we broke through 1500. I get short after we broke through 1500 on a retest. If you look, we never had a retest ever. We never got back up there. I'd also note. 
something fascinating. In the portfolio that I'm in, people still aren't sure gold. Me, I'm actually not interested in this leg. I'm not sure that this is the leg that I want to sell. Now, maybe the light bulb will come on. I am charting it. But as, as we stand right here today, the light bulb has not come on for me for the downside or the upside. Uh, triple top, triple bottom, I don't know what that means, Julie. I, I don't know what it means. We'll see. But for me, it, you know, it will. the light bulb will come on. It just hasn't come on yet. I don't know if I'm going to be bullish or bearish. Right now, I'm in the, hmm, I'm, I'm marking it out. I'm looking. I'm watching. I know what I, I, know what I think. I know, I'm, let me just say it this way. I know what I feel. But what I feel is not very good. No, these were not options trades. These were, these were futures and bullion, real, real, real gold, gold. So hang on a second. Let's do oil, let's do soybeans. Then we'll go back and take that question. So hang on. So here's your homework. Somebody, somebody said, "Boy, I wish we had this earlier." You know, when it was when gold was getting ready to fall. Okay, you ready? You want a real position? I'm going to give you a real position, okay? Here we go. A quick look at soybeans and perhaps some homework. And thank you, Cynthia. I know I'm going really long, but I'm so happy that I can finally talk about this stuff. All right. Novi 2013 soybeans. It's important. Don't use a continuous chart. It's got to be the actual contract. November 2013 soybeans. Everybody know the difference? If you don't, ask your broker. Okay? Or look, you can even Google it. It's, there's lots of good information. Other stuff on, on Median Line, there's stuff everywhere that will help you. Big difference. But November is the speculator month in beans. This is the first month of the beans that are being planted right now. So if you're a speculator, you're trading in Novi beans. So you're all Novi bean traders. Raise your hand and say, I'm a Novi bean trader. Come on. Make the pledge. Let's go. All right, there we go. Come on, everybody. You got to be in. Very good. Okay. Now. Does everybody remember the line of maximum excursion? Well, take a look at this rascal. Here we go. Here's our low. Here's our first rally. Here's our first pullback. Here's our line of maximum excursion. See how it's done? Low, rally, first pullback. Connect the lows, project it forward. Line of maximum excursion. Dead dog simple. You with me? Don't draw conclusions. Just relax and let's go through the logic first. Here we go. The line of maximum excursion. It's tested in 2012. In fact, in 2012, on no V2012 beans, I made a fortune on this move. On this simple line, I have made, this is the sixth trade coming up that I've made on this line. The sixth trade. All very profitable. It comes from this low, one simple rally high, this low, projected for it. It's as simple as it can be. You can see this come down. If you don't want to buy this bottom, here's your retest right there. You got a very small stop. Nice, beautiful summer rally, right? Just what you're looking for. Price continues to rally all the way through the fall. Once the beans come out of the ground, prices do tend to come off. Why? There's lots of beans around, okay? Eventually, they're sitting in silos everywhere, and people didn't hedge much because people were actually talking about Beans, not in the teens, but beans in the 20s. So people were sitting 
with their beans and they were paying to have them stored and they hadn't hedged them yet. So now price is starting to come off and eat into their profits. Now take a look. I start hunting longs in beans in November, third week of November. And it goes all the way to June. Corn planting is done in June, then beans go for about another three or four weeks. Beans are planted after corn. Because first corn has to go in. So they see how much corn they want to put in. Then afterwards they decide how much beans to put in. So the window is November all the way through early June. Generally, we see a low somewhere in late December all the way to middle of February. That's the average. But the window is pretty long. So you now all, every one of you have the line of maximum excursion, right? And you saw it work in gold, I don't know, six times? And believe me, it's worked five times in a row in beans. So now you're all line of maximum excursion traders. Yes? We all believe in the line of maximum excursion. The line of maximum excursion is our God. All right. There's really bad weather in the Midwest. It's raining. I mean, where I lived, I moved to Arizona four years ago. The house that I lived in when I moved, at this point in time in April, the roof was underwater. How about that? That's how bad things were in Chicago. I mean, every river was completely flooded. They shut down the expressways for days. You couldn't get anywhere. It was awful. And, you know, last night they canceled baseball games because large hail is coming through. Price, the weather's awful, yet look at beans. They're just coming off and coming off and coming off. Nobody seems to care. I'm watching it, watching it, watching it. I, you know, I don't, I don't really have any ax to grind. My wife, I don't watch the news. My wife tells me when, at 5:30 when I go by to get some coffee. She gets up to take the kids to do whatever they're doing that morning, and I come in here to teach. And I get my coffee, and I say, hey, "Anything going on? Oh, the flooding in Chicago is getting worse. They're getting two more inches tonight." That's how I get my news. So, but I, I pull up a chart and I go, "Geez, beans aren't even bouncing." They don't, nobody seems to care. One day, guess what light goes on? This line has given me five trades in a row, and I can't tell you how much money. And we're coming right down to this line. And I know nobody wants to buy it. I get that. But it's worked for me. And most people probably don't even have this line. The only thing they have is, boy, it sure looks like junk, doesn't it? This thing looks awful. It looks awful to me. But I know about the mathematics of the line of maximum excursion. I know how to draw it. I know what it means. I know the statistics. And there's a point in time where the light comes on and I go, hey, you know what, nitwit, the line of maximum excursion is right in front of you. Price is going to do its thing. It's got to fall to get to the line of maximum excursion. Maybe you'll get to the line of maximum excursion. If it does, you have a trade. If it doesn't, you don't have a trade. You don't have to worry about it. So what do I do? Well, we do have the other side. I don't remember who it was. Somebody was said, hey, it looks like a, we're due for a major sell-off here. Yes, we do have the other side. You know, there's another line of maximum excursion here. See it? Pull back, line of maximum excursion. Now I've got the upside maximum excursion, and I've got the downside maximum excursion. But you know, I can go one more. If you like that one, Michael, how about this? Now I'm kind of, I'm kind of here's what I kind of want. Where is price going to hit this lower? It is a big triangle. Where is price going to hit this lower maximum line of excursion?
Where? Anybody got any ideas? Looks like 1,200. Not a bad guess. I've got a timing tool. Do you remember before I used the line of maximum excursion and then I used the reflection of it? Remember that? Watch. I'm just going to copy it off this low. The reflection of the line of maximum excursion, the upper one, looks like this. And here's where the two meet. So now I've got a good timing tool. And I've got a line that is taxi tested tough. I've had five huge winning positions off this line. We're coming down for the sixth one. I owe this line a long position if we get down there. We may not get down there. I mean, people may look at the rain and go, oh, never mind, and turn it around. But if we get down there, I'm getting long. BB, don't know, don't care. I put my buy order in. Look, I'm running it at the reflection because I want to get long anywhere close to this blue upsloping line of maximum excursion. Okay? If you look, the low was 11.86, whatever. I got long at 11.89. We closed nicely back above. Stops actually 50 cents. It's a it's a pricey one, but not for me. That's not that big of a stop. It's under here. Limit is 75 cents. This is a 50 55 cent stop. Look at price close nicely back above the line of maximum excursion, and now look at the next bar. Okay, everybody got oriented to what's going on now? Okay, here we go. Here's your homework. You are now all long beans at 11.89. Two and a half cents off the dead low. November 13 beans, you're long at 11.89. This is a game that Amos used to play. Okay, it's called a hat. I'm just about done, Cynthia. It's called a hat. Amos would bring in two hats. One hat would have green slips. The other hat would have orange slips. You'd take a slip from one hat and a slip from the other hat. And the slip from the one hat would tell you let's pay attention and you can talk in a second. The slips from one hat would tell you what market you were trading on the opening. This would be before the openings. And the other hat would tell you whether you were long or short. And you got to make one trade. Then after everybody took their two slips, how many of you have ever seen a $1,000 bill in person? I'm not many. They're hard to find, let me just tell you. You can't get them from your bank. Hi, Mary, how are you? One of my very, very favorite persons is here. Nice to see you, Mary. So, Amos would take a $1,000 bill. He had plenty in his pocket. I carry $2 bills. Amos carry, used to carry thousands. He'd take a $1,000 bill, a crisp $1,000 bill, put it on the desk. He'd say, okay, boys and girls, everybody's got their positions. Well, I'll see you at 4 o'clock. You get one trade. Whoever makes the most money, you get your one trade. You can trade on the opening. You can keep it all day. You can do whatever you want. 
You got one trade. Whoever makes the most money gets the thousand dollars. So, I'm not giving you a thousand dollars, but you're all long. You get one trade. You can put in stops. You can put in profit stops. You can put in logical profit targets. You do whatever the heck you want. But here's your chance to trade like a fund manager, okay? You can be as long as, as many as you want. I, I think the limit position is 600 contracts. I could be wrong, but I have a Reg 47, so I actually don't have a limit. But you can be limit long if you want. I don't care. Or just be one contract. Trade whatever you want. But I want you to follow this up. You're long at 11.89, two and a half bucks off the bottom, okay? This is a beautiful magic pickup, and this is where I'm long. Let's pay attention. Long at 11.89, here's our line of maximum excursion. We busted the upside of the maximum excursion line. You're long at 11.89. This is as of Friday. The way I trade, I don't know what it's done since then, and I don't care. My orders are in, and I don't look until the fax machine clicks until I do my next set of hand charting. If you want to double the range of these lines, you go ahead. Everybody has their own ideas. Not Don't tell me today. I want you to chart it. I want you to practice. I want you to move your stops. I want you to move your logical profit areas. I want you to just go at it and see if you can find the long, big trade. If you want to trade like Amos and say, hey, it's busted, it's down-sloping maximum excursion line, which is its major problem, so now I'm going to get twice as long, go ahead and trade it like Amos. If you want to trade it single, that's fine, too. Trade it any way you want, but I want you to trade it now. You're long at the dead bottom. Not many people were able to buy down there. And I'll tell you, at 11.89, I could buy all I wanted for about 40 minutes. And then it went back up and it never came back down. So you're all long at 11.89. And I want everybody here. There's a lot of people here. And a lot more people are going to watch this. If you're watching this in the next few days, put yourself in this position. You're long at 11.89. And I want you to manage this soybean position, okay? I'm not going to do the weather forecasting on soybeans. Looks like it's hot. Looks like it's cold. This is going on. i got a candle. That's not what I do, okay? Other people do that. That's fine with me. I'm showing you my real sovereign wealth position. This is my portfolio position. This is also my personal position. You're along with me. You trade now, okay? Everybody got it? Do we got that part of the exercise? Okay, now, uh, hand charging is another. Uh, David, you can email me. Hand charging is another system. Now, i got to ask Cynthia, you have been a gracious host. We've gone way long. Do you want to do some questions? Do you want to just say, hey, this has gone so long, let's call it. I'll do whatever you want to do, darling. I appreciate you letting me go this long because I know this was forever. And OIC, I love you, buddy. Tim, um, <clears throat> it has been going long, but I think everybody has been very patient, and there yeah. are some questions. So I would like to open it up for questions, and let's limit that to about the next 15 minutes. Sounds but good. before we jump into the questions, I do have a piece of business to do, and I'm I'm jumping in ahead of you. So while everyone's <laughs> you beat me this time. <laughs> what I am going to do, I do have a poll, and IB's management does require that I run this in each event. It's only open 30 seconds, so if everyone would make your selection, notice I've just opened up the polling panel on your screen. Go ahead and make your selections and then click that submit button that's located in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. That actually allows me to compile those results. And I do review this with management on a weekly basis, so your input is very helpful for me. 
Now notice number two is actually an input field. Don't type your questions there, but if you've got comments or suggestions on other topics you'd like to hear more about, that's a great place to put it. You will have to type fast, though. You've got 10 seconds left before the poll actually ends. Um, so make sure you click the Submit button. Now, if the poll ends too quickly and it's going to end right now, um, you can always send those comments or suggestions to me at webinars at interactivebrokers.com. By the way, the chat panel uh, poll has ended, so thanks, everyone. And that chat panel um, <clears throat> has actually collapsed uh, underneath the polling panel. So notice there's an X on the title bar that will allow you to col uh, close that polling panel. And then find the chat panel title bar and simply double-click to expand it so that you can send him any comments or questions. So thanks for that brief little intermission there. Go right ahead, Tim. Well, okay. I think I'm, I'm going to step into the bees now. Or the rest here, but that's fine. I hope you guys had fun. Thank you all for taking the time to watch this. Um, this was a joy for me. It's it's a give back to everybody. It's a thank you to Amos, who was so generous to me at a young point in my career. So let's see. Uh, what do I think of the idea that some gold bulls are saying you shouldn't look at spot price? Gary, let me just tell you something. I don't care what you're trading. It's in price. Now, most of the people that are saying this were not long when gold went to 800 and 850 in the Hunt Brother days, okay? And I was part of that syndicate. So I've been around when gold has just been completely out of control. And I've also cornered a number of markets and been in other syndicates, okay? Yeah, but Roger, you weren't part of the campaign. I was one of the insiders. So I know what it's like. I know what the euphoria is all about. I get all that. However, all things come to an end. Okay? You have to protect your capital. It's just fine for people on the radio and television to tell you. You know, in Arizona, I'm going to tell you, Every other commercial is from, I don't know, I'm not going to name the gold companies. This is the pullback that you must buy. You should put this in your closet and forget about this. In fact, we'll show you how to take actual position, so, you know, silver to take home and blah, 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 blah. I mean, you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But you know what? You better have a plan. You better have a way to protect your capital. Because if gold goes to 250 bucks, what are you going to do? And don't say to me it can't. How about that? Because it fell from 800 to 250. It can go anywhere price wants it to go. It'll go as low as it wants to go. Or maybe it'll just go straight higher. Have a plan. Stick with the plan. Protect yourself. You can't just say I'm going to buy at 1500. I'm going to buy at 1250. I'm going to buy at 750. I'm going to buy at 250. You can't. Who knows where it's going to go? Okay, you got to have a plan. You got to protect your capital. That's number one. Done. We're not going to sell anybody's books here. Just stop that. Enough. Not even sell my books. Why did you trust the blue fork when it's done nothing with price? You typically look for how price interacts with the fork to judge its relevance. In slide 17. Ooh, okay. Um, does this work? And I'll go. I'll go back to that in a minute when I go all the way back. Um, does this work for shorter time frames than some other markets? It works in any market, in any time frame. It works in stocks. It works if you want to chart unemployment, anything that fluctuates. If so, could you tell us the markets that might cycle monthly or weekly? I don't do cycles, so unfortunately, Diane, though, I can't tell you that answer, but it works in everything. Um, I'm an intraday scalper. I'd like to move into longer-term position trading like what you do. It's psychologically difficult, no doubt about it, to move from scalping ticks to holding them for hundreds of ticks. Any tips on how I can grow this area? Yes. Keep doing what you're doing. While you do that, take methodologies like this and look at longer time frames and sim trade them for a long period of time. Then put very small amounts of money on it. You might do something like open. I'm sure Cynthia would be glad to tell you how to open 
a, 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 an, a, an account at Interactive Brokers that would allow you to do cash for an, exact, for an exchange, for example, where you can do small amounts so that if you're wrong, it costs you $10 or $50, not $1,000, okay? Um, where was your stop when you entered it? Soybeans. It was under this low right here. You can look it up. It's about 55 cents. Seems like big, but if you're looking for the big move. Now, here's the thing. Once you get the swing out of the hole, collapse your risk. But that's that's me. Remember, you got to manage your own position. This was your initial stop. I'm giving you this position. We've already taken out this high. We haven't. Let's say we haven't made this move. You can now move your stop if you want to break even, whatever you want to do. I collapse my risk, but that's me. Do I have lots of failed trades with tight stops once upon a time? Oh, did you have lots of failed stops with tight stops once upon a time? Key is risk management on the basis that we just don't know what will happen next, but we have an expectation and price will do what it does. Michael, I would not suggest that anybody would be able to follow my example. I started trading as a young teenager in my brother's account. I knew Dr. Andrews. I knew Amos Hostetter. And I knew some other great traders. So I had some wonderful mentors that helped me. I had a $2,000 stop loss, so believe me, I use tight stops. Dr. Andrews was a stop and reverse trader. I would not use stop and reverse trading. I didn't have the money to do it. That's why he called me Pansy. That was my nickname. And I said to him one day, hey, you've got several hundred million dollars. Give me your money. I'll give you my money. I'll, I'll stop and reverse with your money. Of course, he wasn't a taker. So it was just a, a poke back and forth. So, yeah, I mean, I, I do take stops. If you want to know my actual uh, statistics, I'm about 66% profitable, life of, my, life of my career, and my average risk reward is about 4.3 to 1. There you go. Just because you're a whale, do you manage to catch the lower high? The size of your position might make things halt where you stock. Regis, there's no way to tell. I understand your question. If I bought, let's say, 50,000 contracts in beans right here, Maybe that turned the market. Maybe. It's a maybe. The only way to answer that question would be for not, would be if we could stop the world, have me not trade, and see what happens. But I will tell you this: I'm not the biggest trader in the world. There are there are other guys my size, and there are times when I run into them, and we actually generally we are gentlemen about it. We get out of each other's way. Should gold break April's low? 1250 looks like the next touch is down sloper. Yeah. Would I be looking for a long there? Well, it's a down sloper. So, no, I wouldn't be looking for a – I need more than that to get long. 1250 was my original target. My secondary target, Michael, is 750. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not a prognosticator. So, at the moment, as I said, in gold, the light's not on. I'm just going to have to follow along. Do you have any favorite markets besides beans and gold? Those aren't my favorite markets. Do you trade crazy crude? Sure. Up and down the back end. I'm a big crude trader, Julie. And if you go back and look at the IB presentations, all you have to do is go to the IB page, go to education, type in my name. You'll find several crude presentations. Big crude trader, sure. Um, when you got long gold around 263, what was your position size as a percentage in relation to your equity? I probably, I probably had, off the top of my head, I probably had about 12.5% of my portfolio at risk. When I doubled it, I probably had 25% because this was a Amos trade. Normally, I don't trade that large. When, you, um, when you're in a position for many years, such as the gold trade, how do you deal with a contract role being so large? First of all, most of my position in gold was in bullion, which means that it was in the cash market. There was no role. But the things, anything that I had in the cash market, I had out in the speculator months. Not every month is a speculator month. It, I'm out almost a year in every month. In every, so I, 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 if I was in there for nine years, I probably made a total of eight rolls. Pretty simple. Um, what's the time frame to the chart displayed? Uh, this currently is daily, and in uh, gold, we went, we went weekly to daily, back to weekly. Sorry, weekly to daily to weekly back to daily. The last run was on daily. 
What made me decide to go long at 1189 soybeans just because of a reflection of the lower of the maximum excursion line without a retest of the line? No. Uh, this line, look at this line. I, I told you, this is the sixth trade I've made on this line. I trust this line. I owe this line this trade. How about that? I understand your question that you know about a retest, but this line has been taxi tested tough. It's been tested. You just don't see it. It's been t if you go back and look at Novi 12, Novi 11, Novi 10 beans. This line has worked five times in a row. This is the sixth time. I'm there. I'm all over it. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, is it okay to use indicators? Well, you're not going to like my answer. To supplement the geometry, especially for a stop or reverse type of trade. SK, you're just going to confuse yourself. That's my answer, and I'm going to stick to it. There are people that I mentor that use indicators. I'll go ahead. I know every indicator ever invented. I'll go ahead and help you with them, but I think they're just going to cloud your judgment. Use price and simple lines. You'll be better off, but that's just my opinion. <clears throat> You've emphasized the point clearly, but just for clarity, you don't look at volume ever. Nope. You are a master at placing your lines in the right place. That comes with experience, absolutely. Some of my lines are in the wrong place and have tried and I've tried volume to spot the important pivots, not successfully. Is there a tip? Yes. For example, when I'm trading in bullion, Michael, it doesn't show up. I may be doing ten times the size of the Comex Gold contract, but it doesn't show up, does it? It doesn't even show up in commitment of traders. And same thing in cash foreign exchange. There, there's ways for me to trade. Same thing in copper, for example. Any of these markets, there are ways for me to hide my positions. So volume actually is very meaningless. I'm sorry. I wish it was meaningful, but it's meaningless. And even on the exchanges, uh, close your ears, Cynthia, there are ways for us to hide our positions. Because we have exemptions, we can decide when to report our positions and when not to report our positions. So even the volume that you see is, I don't want to say fake, it's not always true. How's that? How do you know when to draw more lines as time passes? When a line quits working? Or, Ari, you saw me when I go, you know, I'm drawing this upsloper. It's not making any sense. When it stops making sense, clear your chart and start over again. Um, what do I think about the latest news regarding Reuters giving advanced info regarding the Forex market? Oh, I'm sorry, that was private, wasn't it, Matt? Well, sorry, it's public now. Um, they used to actually sell it to banks in the 80s and 90s for extra money. How about that? So it doesn't surprise me at all, and they're guilty. That's all I have to say about that. And Reuters can do whatever they want to do. Sorry if I just said something I shouldn't have said there, Cynthia. Um, just to repeat on my prior question, why did you trust the blue fork when it's done nothing with price? So oh, 17, right. Hang on. Hang on. Okay. Very simple answer. This has a lot less to do with the blue fork. Let's go one prior. This has a lot less to do with the blue fork and a lot more to do with the first lower, the lower high being taken out with a higher low and then we're taking out swing highs, see it? So this blue, this blue median line is very important because now that we've taken out swing highs to the left and made a higher low, this blue line is the probable path of price, and it's all I have. It's the only thing I have left to work with. So I'm willing to get long down here with a stop under here. This is more structure-related than it is median line. The median line is just going to give me the probable path. It's going to have to build trust for me. And how does it build trust? Right here, when it pops up and rallies and leaves this undershoot, I can now draw in the overshoot. Are you with me? And then when it works, now I can trust the line. But this position is actually taken on structure, not the blue median line. Hope that works for you. Um, where will the recording be? After, after this, you're going to get a link to the recording, and you're going to get all the slides. You don't have to work hard at all. You'll also get a follow-up email from, um, I, from IB telling you exactly how to get to the recording. Don't even think about it. It's, they've got it down to science. 
What rationale did you have to believe gold would go from to two times the Hunt Brothers rally rather than three times? Well, what I said was at least twice. And I was just looking at how long price had been in really a consolidation phase. It made no lower highs, no higher lows. It did nothing for 20 years. So my logic said it's got at least double the range. We see, if we do statistics, this, this 50 percent level that takes you Euclid. Remember an old Greek? He's named Euclid, Euclidean geometry. The most normal, the most important level is 50 percent or doubling. Okay, so we see this doubling of ranges quite often, and we do statistics on that works very, very well. Tripling is not as as common. What time frames would you use for intraday trading? Gold, beans, yes. Um, with gold, I'd probably be doing. Uh, my current favorite at the moment is actually a tick chart, 880 ticks, 888 ticks, something like that. Beans, I don't intraday trade, but I do intraday, intraday trade soybean meal, so ZM. That's a beautiful market, and I trade that again either with – you can trade with 10-minute uh, bars or even better, 189-minute – sorry, 189-tick bars work just magnificent and those I do 24 hours we trade those in the breakfast session all the time soybean meal soybeans I don't I don't really intraday trade them um, in ES um, I trade uh, it's an esoteric one for you if I don't trade a tick chart I tend to trade day only from 8:30 in the morning until 3 in the afternoon Chicago time so I leave that last 15 minutes off on my chart and then it, that's 390 minutes in a chart. Divide that up equally. I use 13-minute bars. You're going to have to go back and watch the watch the replay to get that. 8:30 to 3, 390 minutes divided equally gives me 13-minute bars. I was just wondering if it doesn't capture frequency. Why bother to draw sliding parallels? Well, let me just ask you this, Rajesh. Did this work for you? Do you see now why I do it? It actually worked seven times in this presentation. <clears throat> Go back and watch the presentation. You'll see now why I do it. Okay? Um, let's see. Why doesn't IB have tick charts? Um, they are making lots of technolo technology improvements. They will have tick charts. They will also have better drawing tools. We have been working. We'll continue to work with them. They will. Don't worry. They know what you want, and they will give it to you. Um, you never – oh, Rakesh says, you never give price and position. Why Novi Soy in first time in public? Yeah, it's true. This is the first time I've ever given a position on. Maybe other whales can fade you. Let them fade me. That's okay. At this point, I've already got my. I've got. I'm protected. Okay. If you want, if you want to sell down, that's fine. Knock yourself out. I'm not worried. You know what? They didn't get a chance to get long, so I don't care. I more importantly, I gave you the tools. It's not that I gave you the position. I gave you the tools on how to find it the next time. That's what this is about. I don't really. I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm not trying to tout anything. I want to educate you so that you can learn some of these things and put it into your trading, and you can trade like this. Um, let's see. When you have a stop point because of your size, is it a physical stop order? Yes, I always have a physical stop in. If not, how do you manage active position? There's no such thing as a soft stop. It's, you always have to have a hard stop in the market, period. My broker that I use where it has hard stops, and, and not only that, they know how to move them with my lines. They have my charting package. At the end of the day, I give them my actual charts, and during the night they know how to move my orders with my charts, period. And if they screwed it up, of course, they would be fired. Um, I feel there are several permutations to draw median lines. When I try to draw them, I get confused as to which – this is an easy answer – as to which pivots to use and whether to use a shift. When there is an overshoot, I wonder if I should use a sliding parallel or whether to draw a new median line because I drew the wrong one. Any tips on how to simplify drawing median lines? Yep. Nick, how about this? <clears throat> I just showed you how to use sliding parallels and all this other stuff, and you can 
you know, keep these slides. Put them away. You can watch this recording over and over and over later. Right now, how about this? Use the major pivots, the major high, the major low, the major high, alternating pivots, and just draw the big, fat, median lines and trade off of that, and you'll find 90% of the moves without any of the sliding parallels, without any of the inside picks. If you just use the major median lines and slow down, you won't get as many trades, but you'll be just fine, and you'll learn how to use median lines, okay? The rest of this stuff, it's pretty, it's sexy, it does interesting things, but you can do it just as well by using the major median lines, okay? And, and solid risk, risk management and money management. That's the big key. Um, please give us trailing stop attached to the, to the parent market order. No, Roger, you gotta, you're going to have to do your own trailing stop. Sorry. I gave you the position. You're on your own. Nothing I can do for you. Michael, uh, can you comment on four hour? Oh yeah. Four hour. You said this in earlier, right? At the beginning. Thank you, Mike. Um, can you comment on four hour versus one day charts? What should we use with forks? You can use either one, whatever you're doing. Most hedge fund guys like me look at 240 minute, which is a four hour chart. Why? It's half of a day. So it's the morning session, the afternoon session, the morning session, the afternoon session, Tokyo morning, Tokyo afternoon, London morning, London afternoon, New York morning, New York afternoon. Most people use 240s. But that doesn't mean you can't use dailies, doesn't mean you can't use 60s, doesn't mean you can't use 20s. Use what works for you. Listen, if, you're, if you have a day job, it's dumb for you to spend your time looking at tick charts and five-minute charts because you don't have time to trade them. You're not around to trade them. Then you should be looking at dailies or 240s. If you can only look at the market three times a week, you should not be looking at 240s. You should be looking at dailies. Okay. So you're going to have to find a time frame that works for you. It's the very first thing we do when we, when we do one-on-one -on -one mentoring with people is we work on their time frames. Um, I've been using pitchforks on a weekly and then on a daily. Is that something to pursue, to see inside moves within major? That was my idea to see what is happening. The only thing I would tell you is don't mix and match time frames. Trade weeklies, then only chart weeklies. If you're going to trade dailies, only chart dailies. If you're going to trade 30 minutes, don't look at the 60s to trade the 30s or look at the 5s to trade the 30s. Just pick one time frame. It'll unfold in front of you. Don't worry about it. Otherwise, you're just going to get confused. Julie, it was, you already made some great comments. Novi beans look great. Bottom at $200 moving. Support, I don't know anything about a moving average, but okay. Support at 1300 and consolidating top of 1330 Great setup. Okay. Julie, I want you to email me and tell me how it goes. Okay? I want to know your setups. I want to know... And here, we'll, the, uh, I'll go to the last slide, sorry. I'm getting there, Cynthia, I swear. There you go. There you go. Excellent. Well, Tim, Timothy I'm going to add any one of these. Go ahead. Sorry, Cynthia. Tim, I'm going to jump in here because I do need to uh, wrap this up for today. you got to have lunch, right? <laughs> well, lunch is past. You know, well, I know. Get, there's time to eat. But I did want to thank <clears throat> um, everyone for sticking with us this long. I know this was terrific information uh, that you've brought to us today. But I also need to thank the CME group for making today's webinar possible. Now, Tim has agreed to come back with us on a monthly basis. So what we'll do is wrap it up here <clears throat> and start off next month's webinar with the review of the homework assignment. So, uh, there you I go a couple of questions that came in. So if you do want to um, follow up and see what happened, uh, join us next month. Now, I've got it on the schedule. July 11th is when we should be scheduling next month's event. But please do uh, monitor the uh, webinar schedule that will be posted on our website. Uh, you can find all of this information as well as Tim's previous recordings on the Interactive Brokers website. Go to the Education menu, find the Webinars link, and all of Tim's events are listed in the Recording session, 
section. Um, <clears throat> plus, you have the ability to filter at the top of the screen uh, by speaker, so you can find all of Tim's previous recordings are still posted on our site. There are a few that go back to 2008. So if you do want to review the information, know that it is available. Um, we are going to wrap up today's event, and thanks Tim, what a terrific session. Um, this has been great. And thank you, uh, or all of the traders who have participated here with us today. This is going to conclude our event. Um, so thank you all and to the CME group. So have a great day, everyone, and please remember to trade smart. Special thanks to Tim and to uh, Amos as well. So thank you, Tim. Thank you, Cynthia. I appreciate it. It's always a pleasure. I'll see you next month. Best homework. Gets, uh, gets featured in next month's seminar. How about that? Oh, that sounds great. Okay. Timothy Morge at gmail.com. You guys yeah, have a great time. Timothy oh. Morge at gmail.com. Cynthia, if you, if you can't get it to me, send it to Cynthia. Cynthia will make sure I get it. And I want to remind all of you that um, as you exit the event, you'll find Tim's slides actually open up in a separate browser window where you can print or simply save to review at a later time. So thanks, everyone. And by the way, you'll all be receiving a direct link to today's recorded playback. It normally takes me about an hour to compile and upload this to the server, so watch your email for a link that will come through for me to, for today's webinar. So thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon, and do trade smart. Thanks, all. Thanks, Cynthia. Take care.